What is going on, everybody? And welcome to episode 68 of Ben and Boozin here on the HHH Racing Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Roscoe, and what a fantastic show we have coming for you guys tonight. Not only are we covering the first round of 100-point Kentucky Derby preps with the Jeff Ruby Stakes, we're also going to cover the first round of March Madness with a very special guest, Trevor, from the Punt Fake Pod and Stooley Picks at on Twitter. It's going to be a fantastic show, guys. And right off the bat, I will apologize. I'm sure you guys can hear it in my voice. Vegas has done a number on me. I am not feeling the greatest uh, coming back, but look, the pocketbook's big, and we are going forward, of course, as the show must go on. But guys, as you scroll on the bottom of the screen right now, please go down below the video player on YouTube. Please hit the like button, and please hit the subscribe button. It is the best way to support our channel and the easiest way to support our channel as it is fully free to do, and it really helps us out, lets us know that you're enjoying the content, and will get you signed up to get um, from uh, notifications from YouTube on every single episode that we post here to the HHH Racing Podcast. And also, as you see scrolling right now, bettingandboozin at gmail.com is the email. Please email me with any questions, comments, or concerns you might have or any suggestions for shows going forward. I would love to hear it as I'll respond to everyone. And since we are going live today, as we always do, Please comment in the live chat to the right as we are going to be going through all these races with you guys, as I'm sure you guys already have opinions and have already looked on the Turfway card as it's been out for a few days now. So please comment on, in the live chat on YouTube. But if you're on Twitter, feel free to come on over and put your name in the live chat. We read every single comment. But guys, again, peripherals real quick, then we'll keep going. Um, there is one big thing I want to touch on here, guys, and it is the March Madness Pool returns, guys. The Benton and Booze and March Madness Pool has returned. It is in the top of the description, guys. You have until tomorrow, I mean, basically tomorrow morning um, to sign up for this. You get a free $50 and free merch if you do end up coming on top. And if you um, are subscribed to the Power Picks by tomorrow morning, if you're subscribed to our HHH Racing Podcast Power Picks, which is a free tip, uh, which is a full tip sheet, not a free tip sheet, a full tip sheet every single Saturday sent to you for two full tracks. We'll get to that in a second. But if you're subscribed by tomorrow morning, you will get double the payout. That will be $100 and free merch. Again, go subscribe to that. The password right there is BNB, capital B, lowercase n, capital B, 2024. All the information needed, including the link to the group, is also in the description box below. But if you're more of an audio listener, guys, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor, wherever you get your podcast, every single episode of Bet Nabuzin and every single episode of the HHH Racing Podcast is posted to wherever you get you podcasts. So please go rate, review, and subscribe over there. As I mentioned, the Power Picks, guys, through Patreon.com, it is the second best way to support our channel, and you will get something from it. $15.99 a month, one of the most affordable and profitable uh, pick sheets throughout the entire um horse racing community only four dollars a weekend you get two full tracks and for the full two and a half years that it's been going on we are still well in the positive it, please go the link is in the description also it is on screen patreon.com slash hhh racing podcast to um oh god sorry guys my sickness has really sent me out of whack but please go over there and subscribe to the power picks and for any previous editions of the power picks that you want to see before buying or anything about us hhh racing podcast.com is the place to do that but guys as you see i'm wearing my shards hat and for those of you that know and have looked at this card already the big man is running in race number seven which we will start but not before i bring on my fabulous co-host from west coast mr west coast bias himself from the university of kentucky noah maher from ohio state university charlie freeman and from the East Coast, old man like me, graduated college, Patrick Kunsel. Boys, what's going on tonight? I'm buzzing. I can't wait. This is probably my favorite episode we get to cover over the year. Anytime we get to talk March Madness, I'm at the edge of my seat. So very excited for today. Kyle, let those people get a look at that merch right there. I know. You see that? You see the BNB hoodie that I came in? Yeah, um, yeah. I was very uh, fortunate. Howard picked me up, so I got to wear it in Vegas. And again, one thing I want to pull on with all my co-hosts on is thank you to all of the people that came up to me and Howard at the NHC. It was a fantastic turnout, like more than we ever expected um, to come, you know, just hang out with us, get a beer. It was just a fantastic time to meet all of you guys. 
Um, and like it, you know, this podcast would not be what it is without your guys' help and without your guys' support. We cannot thank you enough. So shout out to anyone that I met, not only for the first time, but also the people that came up to me again after meeting at let's say the Breeders Cup or Keeneland or anywhere. But um just wanted to give a quick shout out to all the people in Vegas, as you can hear the Vegas on my voice. But yeah, the merch came in this week. If you only order print, screen print, keep an eye on your mailbox coming in. But the embroidered stuff is taking a little bit longer, but it will be worth it, guys, because I've seen previews of the embroidered stuff and man, does it look good. So um, shout out to anyone who got their merch. Shout out uh, Tom Espinosa, who tweeted at me today that he got his two hoodies. Um, they look great. And like I said, tweet at me at AP Roscoe K on X or Twitter. Any merch that you guys get in, I would love, love to see it. But I'll go through, guys. We'll, let's go through the chat. We have a lot of people already in the chat so far today. Katie, of course, is here. Katie, thanks so much for joining the show. Mike Carmoli is here. The boys are here. Don't you worry. A little bit late. Again, I blame the sickness. I was a little bit frazzled getting everything ready. But um, we are here, Mike. Thanks so much for doing the show. Mark, of course, is here. Sean Kane, fellow boozers. Absolutely. Uh, racing downwind, Turfway pod in, the, pod in the middle of the Turfway card as we cover, as usual, Turfway runs late. Terry Frank, nice to meeting you, Kyle. Let's go Series F, Crownsway again. Shout out Terry Frank for buying into Crownsway this um, and all of the girls and the boy that we bought at OBS. If you follow me on Twitter, you've seen it. Um, a little more, they're morbidly obese, but they're getting back in there. They're part of the Bob Lothenbach. Uh, stable of course uh, rest in peace Bob Lothenbach but we got, got a bunch of his good yearlings and hopefully they turn out really well Steven Grutner is here enjoying meeting the HHH pod and gang in Vegas looking forward to the Hawthorne pool party absolutely Steven I will see you there that is Mar uh, April 8th the start of Keeneland I believe on bluegrass day as well so anyone that's in the Chicagoland area come out to uh, I believe it's Villa Park OTB Howard um comments in the chat and correct me if i'm wrong but mike carmoli of course i'm here man you know me katie's here trish smith david barista is here alina let's go absolutely man paul conlin's here proud owner of series f thanks so much paul for signing up greatly appreciate it and let, let's get some good home man some good stuff home man like the guy on my hat but tanner hawkins is here um david barista says i heard kyle had some late nights in vegas definitely in a little bit that's for sure but howard teasing a little bit i want to bring up big surprise massive popular guests coming on the show biggest guest ever for the boys guys and these guys don't know that um this guest is coming on next week i'm going to reveal it to them i think i have an idea I sure but I will. Have an idea but um that is that it was confirmed it's going to be a massive guest for us as next week we are covering the florida derby card oh, as well oh, wow. as the march madness sweet 16 games and the guest is going to be a part of both of those hint hint so it's going to be absolutely fantastic do not want to miss next week as well as this week but guys We've rented on for long enough. Let's get right into this, guys. As we're going to cover all stakes races on the Jeff Ruby card, but also we're going to cover, um, like I said, all regions of March Madness and our best bets going forward. But I do apologize as I'm going to have to take some water breaks every now and again. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, but race number seven, you guys can laugh at me all you want, dude. I'm absolutely freaking dying. Have, have a couple drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. I have We're a question. Who do you think make... <laughs> What's up, Pat? What do you got? For oh, me? no. Oh, no. <laughs> Who do you think well, will you make the best host out of the three of us? If, if no, you, yeah. you... Not me. Not me. Not me. <laughs> well, not Charlie because he wouldn't let you guys talk. Yeah. Pat probably wouldn't talk enough, and <laughs> Noah would just be – no would be giving uh, you guys shit the whole Noah. time, so I would yeah, love to hear it, honestly. I would, stop talking. It's gotta be <laughs> I would I would absolutely love to we need, see it. We need, like one of those, we need like one of those Twitter polls and see what people say. Now, yeah. see, now that's what we're talking. Maybe I'll put it up by uh, a YouTube poll later. <laughs> uh, but either way, guys, let's get right into this. May, uh, race 7, guys, is out of the pick 5, but we have to talk about it. As the man on my hat is in this race, it is race number 7, the Animal Kingdom Stakes for 3-year-olds. Sprinting six furlongs on the tapita. And guys, as I bring up the PPs right now is what we'll show first. The morning line favorite is the number seven, I believe. Vote no, if I or the eight vote no, I believe. Uh no, the seven Valentine Candy. I was right the first time. Valentine Candy for Detori and Asmussen coming off a great run in the Ozark at Oakland Park. But there's the big man 
in as your second choice coming off the layoff from the juvenile turf spin. Of course, Kelsey Danner trains Biscitza rides, who both have been, I will say, guys, both have had a fantastic meet down at Turfway so far. Biscitza is winning at 21%, and Kelsey is winning at 26% down at Turfway. Look, he's coming off a long layoff, guys, but I, I really think he's ready. I was talking to the to Tony and Kelsey about it. They really, he really hasn't lost any fitness after coming back from the the. Um, and this is all straight from Kelsey, well, straight from Tony from Kelsey. But he really hadn't lost any fitness, at least to Kel- according to Kelsey, when he came back to training, and he's ran. Plenty of 47 and fours, 47 and threes coming back. This last, that last one on March 13th was a prep for this, um, for this race. And I'm very excited guys. There looks like a lot of pace. What I will say in this, um, in this race, which will be very good for him. And basically I wanted to get the picks in here. Cause I wanted to see which one of my co-hosts was dead to me. Um, it not, if they're not gonna, either going to pick, shards on top or if they're not but look i get it coming off a longer layoff there's some there's a lot of different horses that look pretty formidable in this spot obviously starting with the number seven valentine candy but um charlie you gave me picks for this race so i'll go to you and you are dead to me because you are going with the number seven valentine candy on top and then boys real quick and then boys and we'll give it to, over to you if you have anything to kind of piggyback on then we'll move on to the actual pick five Yeah, to keep it brief, for me, it was as simple as what you just explained. I think um, Shards has the most potential and the highest, you know, ceiling in this field personally. I mean, look, the horse obviously running in a grade one speaks enough for itself. It was just like you said, the layoff is a little concerning for me. I was just wondering, will Shards, you know, maybe need one race back from obviously running in one of the biggest races in the U.S., whereas Valentine Candy has obviously raced more recently and is a horse that is on the improve. And uh, has kind of grown, and what's important to me is shown the ability now to not ha- be a need the lead horse. And in these last three races, has shown the ability to sit just off and go by. So that was really the only angle for me. And then vote no again was just the class angle. Simply, this horse has ran in tough fields and has shown the ability to win in those fields. I think those three are, you know, a class above the rest. Uh, I certainly think if Shards is actually ready off this layoff, could very well be the horse to beat. It's just a question of does the horse need one or not. I mean, Pat, Noah, anything you guys want to touch on? Look, it's a valid point, but I'm just – I'm very excited to see him race again. Like I said, Kelsey um, is getting him back fit, and he's been as fit as he ever has been for this race. I really think he has a good shot, especially with the beginning pace scenario. Pat? Yeah, I mean, and I don't – no, I don't know if you agree, but I do think, you know, going from two to three, and, you know, Kyle obviously is very connected with, you know, these connections. I, I think that this horse can – obviously improve more, but also show that, you know, the, the Breeders' Cup, uh, the turf sprint was, you know, had an excuse in that race. I mean, we yeah. all watched it, saw it multiple times. I'm sure Kyle's watched it over and over again before he's fallen asleep <laughs> a couple times. But, uh, you know, and that's been, like, I think the problem in a couple races. So I, I yeah. think if, if Shards is ready to go, this horse is going to be tough to beat. And, uh, I mean – I don't know if this horse will be, you know, bet a ton down to favoritism, but I, I do think this horse has a very strong case to be the favorite. Yeah, and there's one the we'll t- one thing more I'll touch on, then we'll move on. Pat's right. I mean, there's one thing that we've always wanted for Shards, and it's a clean run. Um, he these last two races, he's been stuck behind that last race in the Breeders' Cup, stuck behind again, was able to finally get some room, and did end up. Closing a little bit on Big Evs, Valiant Force was absolutely flying with a clean run on the outside. Um, after the wire galloped out to second, um, nobody was beating Big Evs that day. Let's just be completely frank. The other thing is that the last thing I'll touch on, then we'll move on. Kind of basically just going off on a rant of, you know, why is my horse going to win and why is everyone else suck? It's not what I'm trying to do here. But um, we always we thought the five was was a little too sharp for him. The five and a half at Keeneland was, um, we actually believed it was a much better track um, and layout for him. Now running six at Turfway, obviously you have to handle synthetic, but we think the six fits him even more. And that'll give him obviously a little bit more room to be able to close into these leaders. And if they're going to go 22 45, I think um, Shards honestly has a very good chance. And obviously, I will be watching on Saturday with hopefully. Um, a big bet and a big heart, um, and that can get him home. But, guys, that's the Animal Kingdom stakes. But let's get to the pick five here where all our picks come into play. But um, 
John Moeller brings up, you sure that's water? I Tonight, John, for the first time really in Benton and Booze in history, it is water. I'm, I am I need to shake this because I got we got a lot of good stuff coming up, i.e. the freaking the uh, grade one gamble coming up and on golf season starting. I got to shake some of this sickness as we come into spring here. But the, tonight it is water. I apologize. Not a whole lot of boozing going on right now for me, but Benton, there definitely will be a lot of that mark bogas says he likes the 43 it's 47 and 3 workout like i said he's been working fantastic uh, with otago another one that f- friends of the podcast would know he's running really well right now so um i have a good feeling that shards is going to come back and run a really nice one on saturday but guys enough of the the basically glazing uh that i'm doing for my horse let's move to the light pick five starting with the rush away stakes and i'll bring up the equibase right now guys as it's giving me a hard time but let's see here it is the 23rd there we go okay so race number eight is the rush away stakes and it is for um here we go it's for mile 16th for three-year-olds and uh, our three-year-olds only draws a full field of 12 guys and if there's one thing we know about turfway they're known for those big fields and that anything can happen morning line favorite is number nine tennessee for luan machado and Brad Cox, second choice, goes to number two, Blue-Eyed George, who unfortunately will not be running in this race. Um, Kevin Kierstein of Churchill Downs, obviously Turfway being a Churchill track, he posted earlier um, about race, who, who's going in and who's not. Blue-Eyed George will not be running in this spot, so your second choice will go to the number eight, Neat for Atris and Castellano, and third choice at six and one shared between multiple Horses, but guys, I'll bring up the picks right now, and you'll see we're kind of all over the place. Pat, very astute, my friend, going with a 12 to 1 horse that I have on top, number 10, Legree for Jareth Loveberry and Al Stahl. Charlie going with the number 12 footprint for Leperu and McPeak, and Noah going with the morning light favorite, Tennessee, which is where we will land first. Noah, you're going to go first and tell us why we're all wrong, and this race is going to chalk out with the number nine, Tennessee. Well, in this race, I was kind of between Blue Eye George and Tennessee, and I ended up going with Tennessee just because I wasn't sure if Blue Eye George would run in the spot. Um, but with this card, the the trend that I kind of followed was I'd rather take horses that have kind of been at Turfway rather than the shippers. So this is just one that's been super consistent. Obviously, he's loved the Turfway track, which a, a lot of horses kind of don't tend to run well on. Um no, it's Brad Cox, it's Machado, who's been a leading rider there for the last couple of years. Um, and it's a, a three-year-old that's moving forward. So uh, in a race that I think is pretty wide open, just one that's pretty easy to kind of bank on in this spot. Yeah, and obviously he was running very well. Um, Patrick, you have this horse in second, then we'll kind of go into our um, our top pick in the number 10. But this horse makes a lot of sense. He has tactical speed. This last race, the 76 not a whole lot of horses in this race have very high speed figures. So the 76 improving off of 71 definitely fits in this type of spot. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I've always uh, appreciated horses that have, uh, you know, had a knack for finding the wire. And this horse has uh, the last two times out, uh, two times out winning by a head and winning by obviously one length um, in, in those two spots and l- likes Turfway being two for two. Uh, so I, I think this horse um, considering, you know, the price is going to be three to one is kind of why I'm, transitioning over to the 10 uh what do we call Legre Legre Legrese um you know I think this horse has shown to be tactical um you know la- uh last t- last time out I mean was ultra impressive uh you know being a little bit more forwardly placed um and just you know making a, a sweeping move and cleared and ended up winning by six lengths um and beat a horse who actually came back to win um you know, a, a smaller stakes race. So I, I think, uh, you know, this horse being 12 to one will not be the price on uh, Saturday. Yeah. And the thing is to, to keep in mind, and obviously I noticed this, I'm sure you did too. This race is one on the slop off the turf. So mm-hmm. people always question, you know, how, how good that field actually was, but that 78 buyer on the dirt guys gives me a lot of confidence that this horse can actually run. And obviously Al stall would not put this horse in this type of race. If he can't run and Legree or Legris, however you say it, I honestly, man, I'm so all over the place right now. I couldn't even tell you. Legree looks very good. And this race is going to be a hot pace. That's the one thing I want to touch on before we move on to um, 
to no uh to Charlie here, who has the 12 on top, who's probably thinking the same exact thing we are. See, the five I was going out in front in the fact that uh number five twirling point will be out in front, but with the six and the eight not too far behind, neat's definitely gonna be close and tireless is going to be close as well, which leaves the number 10 Legree, the number nine Tennessee, and the number 12 uh footprint in very good spots and charlie i'll kind of take that into your top pick who i have in second the number 12 footprint also looks to get a good trip in this spot yeah you know i'm happy you showed the pace indicator because that was exactly how i kind of saw this race i thought the 12 and 9 would sit the two best trips of anyone in the field and i think this is a pretty open race uh again i i think the favorite is very talented i i think noah touched on a lot of what i liked about the nine as well I just, and that's why I have the horse third. I just think for a race this open, I would rather try to beat the favorite. I think that's kind of a common theme for this entire card we're covering is these bigger fields that, you know, have favorites that are very beatable, not because they're bad, but because, I mean, we're covering obviously a huge bit of turf, there's a lot of really solid horses here. Um, I just think footprint's really improving, and I'm sure you kind of touched on this or saw this too, Kyle. I really like the effort last time out, not just because obviously the buyer figure and the horse coming close, but because uh, footprint was able to sit a lot closer to the lead. I mean, obviously I know three lengths isn't on the lead, but I think that ability to stalk is crucial because in the past you can kind of see there's been races where this horse was absolutely nowhere, had to fly from the clouds and couldn't quite make it. So I think with a hotter pace and if this horse can sit that stalking trip at six to one would be a great price. The horse is yeah. working decently as well. And then I'll real quick, cause I know you already touched on the nine with the Pretty five. Um, again, I know it's a really hot pace, um, I just wanted to at least have someone with that kind of angle, as I've touched on a bunch of someone who loves closers, just to cover myself, have, you know, the opposite with the speed horse. And we talk about this all the time, all these races that should have a hot pace sometimes just don't. So I want to be covered. I want to have the speed of the speed in case that's the case. Uh, this horse has also shown the ability at times to be able to, at least two back was able to sit off a little and close somewhat and has been working forwardly as well. And obviously Detoria board, you always have to acknowledge. So, uh. That's also why I think the five's interesting. <laughs> no, your favorite horse, Lord Bullingdon, over there on the West Coast. I know how much you love that horse, but close it out, Noah. You have the or sorry, no, number two, Blue Eyed George is out. So that's the only horse we really didn't touch on. Um, Tricari Patrick has this horse in third, another kind of speedball who I'm sure was following that same type of beat as Charlie. Um, with you gotta have you want to have at least one horse towards the lead if the speed doesn't materialize. Neat is also a horse that makes a lot of sense towards the front of the field and can be tactical is shown to be able to track before. So that one at five to one could be one for Atris. But um, I think Legree makes a lot of sense in here. But as we'll come as we'll come to uh, at Turfway, as you all know, there's a lot of different ways you can go in a lot of these races with massive fields and um, especially with horses, horses shipping into Turfway coming from dirt to synthetic. You'll never know how they'll really attribute to it. So there will be a lot of good, um, a lot of good handicapping angles to go for on Saturday. I'm going 10, 12, 9. Patrick's going 10, 9, 7. Charlie's going 12, 5, 9. And Noah's going 9, 2 or 9, 5. And then, um, Noah, do you have a third pick before we go off uh, on the race? Throw, throw your, throw the 10 in there. Beautiful. So Noah will be going um, nine, t- nine, five, ten. But guys, let's move on to the race number nine, the Latonia Stakes. And this one is a mile and a sixteenth for Phillies and Mares, four year olds old and upwards. So this is the older Phillies and Mares race going a mile and a sixteenth with a field of ten. The morning line favorite is the very talented the number nine or the number nine botanical again for Luan Machado and Brad Cox at six to five. Number two, Chop Chop. For Axel Concepcion, your 2023 leading apprentice jockey of the year. Also for Brad Cox at three to one. And Sister Luann, one of Patrick's favorite horses on this show, going off at nine to two for Safi Joseph and Castellano. But guys, let's switch over the picks right now for race number nine. You'll see both two of us, Charlie and I, are both going with Chop Chop on top. And I've I've had some very dubious opinions of this horse in the past, but this horse seems to have turned it around on the synthetic. Patrick, you are going with the number nine botanical on top at six to five. And then Noah's going com- off the beaten path on a horse that I actually thought was very interesting, but I didn't have the room to put in on my top three forever after all. But we'll start with the morning line favorite. Patrick I means you'll be going first. What'd you like most about the number nine botanical in this race? Yeah, you know, botanicals five for five at Turfway, which um isn't too shabby. Um <laughs> last you know, time I checked, yeah. Yeah, and you know, 
you know, ran in the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, you know, she uh, lost, you know, I, I don't, was a step slow in that race. That complete toss uh, was just not, not a good race at all. Um, listen, this horse has, you know, been working well. Cox is, has an idea for where he wants to send this horse, you know, later on into the summer. I, you know, I think she's going to, you know, mean well, um, you know, beat Chop Chop off the layoff too, which I thought was impressive. Um, so I, listen, I just think that, you know, if you think Chop Chop's going to improve off of that performance, maybe you can make a case, but I think Botanical is, is right right now and, you know, has some time off from that win last out and should be ready to go again. Uh, you know, I just hope the price isn't too low. Well, not to mention she ran that really nice race off of a freaking, you know, seven month layoff as well, uh -huh. running from the Kentucky Oaks into this race and ran in front of Chop Chop. But I'll tell you what, uh, Noah, I'm sure you saw this as well, um, that that Botanical should not have it easy like she did last time. She was out by herself running, you know, two lengths in front of everybody else. Chop Chop had to make a middle move and still kept on to her late. But um, it, time form has it as a fast pace. So number three, Marksman Queen and number five, Sister Luen. Maybe not as fast as Botanical early, but definitely not going to let her have it her own way. And Noah, you're going with a 15 to one shot. Um, as you can see, the number four forever after all here with the, with just in front of number two, Chop Chop. This is a horse I thought was really interesting and was going to throw instead of botanical and throw out botanical completely, but I just really couldn't do it. But that last race is definitely very good. Yeah. You know, I, I easily could have gone the two or nine in the spa. They're, they're both very logical, um, but this is turf way and crazy shit happens. Um, so I've got forever after all on top for all you Luke Combs fans. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, the way that I saw this horse, um, she was in the Al Stahl barn for, for quite some time. And I think Al Stahl always knew that she had ability, which is why he never uh, dropped her down to that maiden claiming uh, and, and put her in for a tag. Yeah. Um, so she, she ran a really nice race four back. Um, and she really hasn't been able to do it since. Uh, but then once she switched to the Brennan Walsh bar and I, bar, and I, I think she, he's kind of got her figured out. And the way that she won that last race, I thought was really impressive. Um so I think this is just one of those horses that we, we, we talk about where they, they get onto a surface and they just really cherish it. So I think this is definitely an example of that. And, you know, if if uh, Botanical gets pressed and Chop Chop's not good enough, uh, maybe this is a horse I can sit where Timeform says is mid-pack and, and come with a run. Yeah, and this is a horse that's going to sit that trip in front of Chop Chop, although Chop Chop ran pretty close to the pace last time, albeit in a five-horse field. That last race is definitely one to uh, to open your eyes a little bit. To um, she never really she's she's came from the back in the past at Churchill here at a mile and sixteenth, but then was a more of a lead runner under the Al Stall barn. Maybe Brennan Walsh would just had her sit, you know, taught her to sit. Um, this is her first race off Lasix, as I know Pete Visco. If he's in the chat, he pays attention to that. Not so much for myself. But it's definitely one thing to keep in mind. But last time out, I mean, showed a com basically a completely new running style over um, over the Turfwood track for, track for the first time and off of a decently long layoff. Looks to get a fast pace to close into. I am honestly very interested in the number four forever after all, even though I don't have her in my top three. But Charlie, we'll touch on Chop Chop and then I'll let you go through um, anything you want to touch on on everyone else. Then we'll kind of move on. We'll go a little bit quicker here. Um, Chop Chop just looks to sit a really nice trip. That last race in the winter green, you could argue who did she beat, but she did it very well, earning her top, uh, top buyer massing, uh, matching her silver bullet day back in early 2023 when she was on the Kentucky, um, when she was on the Kentucky Oaks trail, but, um, ran behind botanical two back, but got one before, um, before, after she ran that last race and looked very good doing it. Yeah, I mean, I can probably say, actually, for this entire pick five, I didn't pick a single favorite. So I finally can confirm I've fully beaten the chalk allegations. They permanently reside with Kyle now. Uh, but no, look, I, I like the effort last time out, taking that step forward to kind of find that form again and show that, you know, this isn't a horse that's declining by any means. Uh, again, I think the favorite is ultra talented, but it just didn't do enough for me for a horse that's going to be even money four to five. I'd like to try to beat that horse. Uh, and I'll talk about that more with my best bets later. Uh, they already talked more than enough about the nine. Noah 
uh, I know, and you already kind of touched a lot about the four, so I won't say too much, although I also did really like the four. It was actually a horse I was kind of tempted to move up even more. Uh, I just think the two and nine should be a step above the field. But again, I think getting Brendan Walsh as the trainer and that last effort is great. Uh, so the only other horse I'll touch on since my three were kind of already covered is I think Marksman Queen is one other horse that I was kind of debating about throwing in there that's interesting. Um, again, I think the pace isn't the most ideal situation. That was why I left the horse off is it looks like there will be a lot of pace. But this horse did go, you know, a mile and 70 uh, in decent fractions at golf and was able to go the whole distance. And even last time out, stretching out to a mile and a 16th, the horse didn't fade by any means. I mean, again, it was a decent pace and the horse held up pretty, she, she held up pretty much the whole way. Obviously, you can see uh, as a, a well-meant horse, I also think it's interesting that the tour is getting aboard. Obviously, Johnny V rode this horse in the past as well. So, you know, a horse that hasn't had too much experience yet in the U.S., so there's certainly room for improvement. And has ran two solid performance where the figures certainly fit with another step forward. So that would be the uh, only other horse that we haven't talked about that I think at a price could at least be interesting to show something. And Patrick has this horse in third as well. Again, just kind of have covering all bases here with horses that are going to be on the lead and towards the back. But this race definitely looks like another one that's going to have a ton of speed up front. So Botanical is going to have her hands full. And if you like a closer, Chop Chop's obviously a very decent option, or you can go with the fo the four forever after all who Noah has on top, who is going to be at least four times the price. I'm going two five nine. Patrick's going nine three two. Charlie's going two nine four, and Noah's going four two nine. Guys, switching over to race number ten on the card, and is the Kentucky Cup Classic a Grade Three? running a mile and an eighth, of course, on the Tapita track. Another full field of 12, guys, as we touched on how good Turfway does with their field sizes. Morning line favorite, and deservedly so, the very, very talented number three, Wolfie's Dynagos, for Jonathan Thomas, Jose Ortiz coming into Kentucky to ride. Second choice will be number one on the rail, Surly Furious for Abel Cedillo, and Greg Wismer, I believe, is his uh, first name. And the third choice will be the number 12, fantastic again, Gerardo Corrales and Wesley Ward, a name that hasn't been mentioned too much on this podcast. And if I was a betting man, I would have Charlie picking the Wesley Ward on top. And what do you what do you know? He does go with the number 12 on top. Um, but the rest of us are all going with the number three, Wolfie's Dyna Ghost. Uh, Noah, um, Patrick went first last time, so I'll let you go first here. Although, no, I'll let Charlie go first, since Charlie's kind of the odd man out. Number 12, fantastic game, Charlie. Anything else other than this is your your man, Wesley Ward? Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't also point out the fact that for Wolfie's Donegos, I didn't have the horse anywhere. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, throughout this car, I, I've been... You know, better or worse, but... Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been emphasizing that, uh, you know, I'm trying to beat favorites. And uh, again, I just think this is a card where it's very septal and like Noah touched on it. Turfway, a bunch of crazy shit happens. So this is the kind of place if you want to do that. Uh, look, no, honestly, for me, it's funny because I know I always kind of get the rep about being a Wesley horse, me being biased. But since he tends to have speed horses, I actually usually don't like picking his horses in anything other than turf sprints or, you know, synthetic sprints, stuff like that, because that's where, his, you know, his expertise is. Uh, but this is one of those few speed horses he's had that's actually shown the ability to consistently, you know, stay up and not fade. I really loved the effort last time out. Um, you know, the rail, I mean, the, the draw all the way to the outside doesn't phase me. I know it's not the most ideal, but I would, you know, honestly prefer that than this horse getting buried on the inside. Uh, I, you know, I trust that the jockey can be able, you know, who's ridden this horse multiple times. I trust that he'll be able to get him over enough. The horse is working forwardly, two very solid works. And, uh, you know, obviously Wesley tends to like his horse is pretty ramped up. So, you know, if you see this horse isn't ramped up, you'd be concerned. I mean, look, this horse ran against Forte, Red Route 1, two fills, Major Dude. I mean, has run against everybody, the, the who's who of horse racing, has run against completely stronger fields than a lot of these other horses. Not that there's are other talented horses. You know, beat Shirley Furious last time out, who is another horse who I think is actually very interesting and solid in this spot. But again, look, you're, I think you can honestly get every bit of that four to one. Will this horse wire the field? I don't know. I think there's other speed, but I think it makes sense. I think the one is very interesting. I was kind of flipping between these two back and forth because I think the one could get a nice ground saving trip. And with a race that there is definitely enough speed for, uh, that's kind of how I landed on Charlie Furious as well. As, I mean, obviously the effort last time was monster to, you know, come back after, you know, a, a decent win and as a low price to then come out at, you know, three to one and change and dominate. Uh, and then I'll just run through the my last pick real quick since I've already touched yep. on two of them. So then I had the five and third, uh, Celeste, who I think is actually a horse we've 
covered before. Yeah, in that race at GP where the horse lost uh, in that marathon race. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, for me, I just think this horse is interesting. You know, ran neck and neck with Wolfie's Dynagos, who's, you know, the heavy favorite in this spot. Uh, so I think Celeste is interesting. Again, I think the setup could work out well. This horse always finds a way to sit that nice trip either on the lead or just off. So I think Celeste at a price and with a jockey as aggressive as Luis Saez is interesting. Uh, and then I'm kind of curious, uh, Kyle, what you think is, is a horse you've liked in the past that I didn't have anywhere, but I'm curious what you think about Verstappen. Yeah, I know. I, I'll, uh, you know, we always hope he runs as fast as Max Verstappen drives, but <laughs> I have my things that I'll get to um, when we get, uh, when I get to my uh, kind of, um, oh my gosh, Kyle had that one lined up, by the way, you, yeah. you had that lined up all day. Oh, oh, <laughs> Hey, I, I, I picked this horse every time. I say that every time I knew I it was, that's why I had to set him up. I knew he would pick this horse again, I, bro. You set that, you set that ball up on a tee. I'm driving at 300 yards, but look, um, Rodney Evans also brings up a good point. Um, there is a pretty decent run up to the first turn, but the 12 post, um, is a is not easy, especially when you want to be forwardly praised. Plays Rodney says, "Hey, y'all crazy! Hey, look at those two guys on the bottom, man. No one and I don't have this horse anywhere. Don't pull us all in there." But twelve will not hit the board if you're not a monster kisser. Goodbye. But again, very strong worded. But the point is, is that the twelve is not easy to um, to overcome, especially when you want to be forwardly placed with a lot of horses to the inside. But uh, Patrick, I'll go to you first, man. Wolfie's Dyna Ghost. One of the most talented, probably Tapita runners in the entire country, and uh, he's shown it time and time again. This horse is now six, going into his six-year-old year with this start. But man, if this horse gets to the lead and is able to slow it down at all, this horse is very, very formidable in every race. Yeah, that that was my biggest note too. Was you know this horse is going to be forwardly placed, and I think that you know when he does, I, I'm pretty sure he'll get to the lead in this spot. Um, He's going to be tough. You know, the Tapita plays interesting, you know, watching, not saying they're the same, but, you know, watching Gulfstream a lot, uh, you know, you get to the lead and stuff like that, you stand a better chance. So if Turfway plays somewhat the same with the Tapita, um, Wolfie's Dine goes, you know, especially at three to one is, is going to be really tough, especially with, you know, has raced in the past here at Turfway and is two for two. Um, I, I think this horse will be uh, well handled in a, in, in a uh, in a tough spot. You know, a spot that you know I feel like I don't know about you guys, but this is one of those races where you know it's on a big day, a big card, and you know you get a lot of horses that are older, that are bigger prices, but have won big races. And it's like you know, do you revert back to their days when they were throwing up bigger figures, and you think they could run back, or you know, is it a newer face? Which you know, I'm kind of not going with, but I think that this is one of those races. And no, I don't know about you, man, but you know, you don't have to go far back for this horse to have very good numbers, being that the last two are 99. Um, <laughs> hey, Mike, come on, we would make it to the end, maybe a little bit, a uh, little bit on the buzz side, but we would have a ton of fun. That hey, next to me and Paul pronouncing the uh, horse's gender wrong, but no, um, again, Wolfie's again, as Patrick touched on, Wolfie's down goes is extremely talented, and albeit they're. Time form has this race being with a lot of speed, but this horse's numbers, man, just and every both time form and buyer are are extremely formidable in this spot. Yeah, the thing that led me to him was it just seems like anytime Jonathan Thomas kind of takes a break with him and ports him points him towards a big spot, he just does nothing but fire. Um, so in a spot like this where he's got some time off, I know he is six. Um but it just off those, you know, a couple of months of layoff where he can get his rest and get ready to go. He just, he just seems really dangerous. And I think a big tell is that Jose Ortiz comes in and rides. Yep. Um, just the fact that, you know, Jose is going to be there all day. Uh, and I'm sure there's definitely other places he could have gone, but just the fact that he hops on here, I think is a pretty big tell. I completely agree with you. And, and if for those of you that don't know, Jose Ortiz is actually coming over to Kentucky to ride for the, um, I think, mm-hmm. the entire spring, yeah. um, if I saw correctly. So this might be the start. And Saratoga for the summer, yeah. Yep. So he's going to try and get away from his brother and hopefully get a few riding I, tie, I think we, you know, not to, his belt. not to talk about it too long, but I do think that he's doing that predominantly because Belmont, you know, is closed. And, yeah. Which, you know, listen, hey. Well, I'll tell you what, that Kentucky money, you know, uh-huh. money speaks for itself. Uh, real quick, guys, I'll go through my top two. And the one horse that 
um, I want to touch on is the one who I think is just extremely interesting in this spot as well. Verstappen coming off. He's usually a marathoner, but he has run well. He ran well at uh, the J.B. Schuster mile at a mile and 16th, uh, losing to Charlie's favorite horse in the entire world. Um, and has run at Turfway before and has run very well at Turfway before. Granted, a little bit longer distance, has lost to Wolfie's Dynagos before. I just think this horse can show a little bit more tactical speed. And if this if this race does heat up, this could be uh, Verstappen could be one to pick up the pieces late as he has, I mean, very good numbers across the board and has run well at this distance. But certainly Furious Guys is the one that makes a whole lot of sense. If you want to play that type of pocket trip if they go pretty quick early. Um, that last race at Turfway is phenomenal. And granted, you can argue who he beat, but that 102 buyer is one of the top in the field. And if he runs anywhere near that again, he could be a, definitely a force to be reckoned with. It was Glenn Wismer. Pardon me. I thought I was Greg. I thought I read Greg. Blame the sickness again. That's I'm just going to blame that throughout the entire show every time I, I mess up. But um, the last race was very, very good for Surly Furious. And if, again, any replication of that with any type of pace in front, Surly Furious is definitely one to be reckoned with. I'm going 3 2 1. Tra Patrick's going 3 12 5. Charlie's going 12 1 5. Noah's going 3 9. 10 guys we're gonna go pretty quick here bourbon and oaks is three old phillies it's three old philly race on the road to the kentucky oaks field of 10 morning line favorite is the number one alpine princess and i know there was some um some talk about her not running in the spot was confirmed that she will be running in the bourbon and oaks so she will be your two to one morning line favorite the second choice is going to be the number four Maxi Superfly for Walter Rodriguez and Eric Foster. Third choice will be the number six, Band of Gold, Leperu, McPeak. Jet lag pass tonight. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that in the chat. So let's move on, and I'll bring up the picks right now, guys. And two of us are going with number six, Band of Gold. Charlie's going with number five, moving on up at 12 to one. And Noah's going with number two, winnable at 10 to one, guys. So upset on the cards from us. Um, although the chat actually Thomas Minos has number four Maxi Superfly. So again, upsetting the number one Alpine Princess. And I think we all are going with that there's going to be a lot of speed in this spot. But I will start with Charlie, as you're going with the longest shot out of any of us, the number five, as my DRF refuses to load. Number five, move on, on up and then go through your top three and then we'll and then kind of dish it to someone else and we'll keep going here. Yeah, so uh, time for my long shot of the uh, sequence. I mean, we're talking about me avoiding favorites. I'm really doing it here. Uh, look, like you touched on, I think there's a lot of speed. I think moving on up could sit a perfect stalking trip like the horse has the last two efforts. Uh, look, maybe it's because Gulfstream's my track and I'm a little biased towards, uh, you know, what they're able to do in choosing the invader. But look, the horse is working forwardly. Uh, you can see in these last two efforts, there's been a big step up in improvement uh, off the, you know, trainer switch and is continuing to improve in every effort. Uh, will the horse take the necessary step up for her to win this race? We'll see. But again, for me, like I've been saying, crazy shit, like Noah said, crazy shit happens at Turfway. I think it's another open race where I'd like to beat a favorite. And I think if uh, moving on up, you know, takes another big step forward, this horse could certainly win. Uh, then looking at the eight pink polka dots. I mean, look, this horse just absolutely flies. Obviously, the only way this horse wins is wiring. But the horse was able to win by a comfortable margin in both efforts. I understand this is a step up in class. Uh, but, you know, gets the same jockey also just had another just had a bullet workout at fairgrounds. Uh, you know, the distance shouldn't be a problem. The horse has dealt with hot paces when they would run away. Uh, to be honest with you, if it wasn't for the fact that I just think there's a little too much speed. I think this horse is extremely interesting. And honestly, I would be trying to play some sort of win bet on the five and the eight. I think there's a ton of value or at least mix them up in some underneaths. And then obviously at the one, I'll let someone else like Patrick talk more about the one maybe because he obviously is the horse second. I uh, just couldn't leave the favorite off my ticket completely. But uh, Pat, I'm guessing you like this one a little more than I do. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what is man freaking man's off the pat, but the number one Alpine princess, um, Charlie's dishing it over to you. This horse looks, it can, has the ability to sit as well, which could be a very, um, a very necessary spot because as I'll show the time form guys, another fast pace rejected, but they do have the number one Alpine princess stalking. Is that kind of what you saw with this horse bet? Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, listen, this horse is, you know, two races back, you know, the allowance race and then, uh, the race on the 23rd, 
uh, at fairgrounds were very impressive, uh, especially with a little bit of trouble at the beginning. Um, you know, and then I last out in the Rachel Alexander, you know, she, I'm not sure, you know, if it was the slop or what, she just didn't run very well. And, you know, this, this, you know, um, this class here with, you know, the girls, you know, prepping for the Kentucky Oaks, you know, it's kind of wide open. I know. I mean, I know there's a horse out in California, um, you know, who I don't think is going to be able to run if I'm correct, you know, in, in the Oaks, Um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be tough, but I think this horse is going to improve again. But, you know, I'm going to go with the six band of gold like you are, Kyle. And I mean, I know, you know, you have a lot to say about her and what how good she can be. Well, I mean, obviously, the Martha Washington stakes is the one I'm trying to key in on. I just think this pace is really going to set up Alpine Princess. Definitely your most likely winner, especially if she's able to sit a stalking trip on the inside. But band of gold, Leperu, McPeak. I know I'm not the biggest. Um, I'm never. I'm never. I've never been the biggest Leperu fan. I'll just be completely honest. But Leperu is going to have this horse in a good position towards the back, and if they go fast early, this is going to be the one that I'm going to have flying from the back. Alpine Princess easily could get the jump on Band of Gold and run first and run one two. Um, this horse is just going to be at least I would say twice the price if not three four x the price and kind of key in on a race for the martha washington stakes i'm um the honeybee she was way too far back in my opinion um made her run towards the end but the maiden lemon muffin at whatever the hell the one i don't even know massive a number gets the win but i'm keying in on two back to try and get her to run a very uh of, and basically just trip out in this race um and no i'll kind of go to you finish it up here number two winnable uh the other mcpeak in this spot at 10 to 1 coming off a really nice win at turfway close up the conversation what'd you like most about winnable yeah well the the thing with winnable was um i feel like mcpeak is not one to kind of have his first first crank and the way that she won last time, I know the number is not great, but just the way that she won was very impressive visually. Um, and I think it's very ambitious that McPeak ends up putting her in this spot. Um, you know, she's had to justify out of a curling mare. I think that the extra distance will help. Um, I think the second second start of the career, you should see natural improvement. Um, and I'm just not so sure about some of these favorites. I think Alpine Princess is about as vulnerable as it gets. Alpine Princess kind of gives me those fluffy socks vibes, Kyle, from a couple weeks ago <laughs> uh, when we covered the uh, Tampa card. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've got her in third just because I don't think this feels great. Yeah. Um, but I'm just kind of looking for a fresh face uh, and somebody that I know is going to move forward and improve. And I think Winnable could be it. I don't disagree with you by any means. Um, the last horse we'll talk about, Thomas Spinoza brought up Maxi Superfly, your second, your second choice. Getting on all weather, um, last four races have increased each time. I mean, you see 61, Bayer has 56, 59, but still this 80 right here in the Cincinnati Trophy um, is very, very good at 23 to 1. It's just a matter of I just don't know if she'll be able to get the same trip like that as she did last time, especially with horses coming to her outside, as we touched on earlier, like number eight pink polka dots, but definitely will be part of the pace scenario and could – um, if she gets loose somehow, if the maybe the eight doesn't break, Maxi Superfly could be in the mix as well. But number one, Alpine Princess is definitely your most likely winner. Um, but Band of Gold, I think, might have something to say about that. I'm going six five one. Patrick's going six one nine. Charlie's going five eight one. Noah's going two seven one. Guys, last race of the sequence, of course, is the feature. The number tw- the race number twelve. The Jeff Ruby Stakes, your 100-point Kentucky Derby prep race. Field of 12, or sorry, field of, no, it will be a field of 12 because um, the number five, Agate Road, uh, who is your actually your second choice at 7-2 to two, is not going to be running in the spot. Pletcher will be choosing the Louisiana Derby for this race, but does have the numbers 14, Triple Espresso, running in this spot at 12-1. to one. So we'll still be a full field unless other scratches occur. The morning light favorites, number 10, endlessly for Umbuto Rispoli, making the trip out here for Michael McCarthy. Second choice will be the number six, Northern Flame, 
for Leperu and McPeak, and your third choice would be number nine, Seize the Gray for Nick Juarez and the coach, D. Wayne Lucas. Guys, switch over. Last picks here as we switch over to the Jeff Ruby stakes. I am going with the number nine, Seize the Gray. We are going with four different horses, which actually doesn't end up happening too often. Pack's just going number 10 endlessly. Charlie is going with the number uh, the number six, Northern Flame, and Noah's going with the number four, Noted, who's honestly a very interesting horse. But Patrick, we'll go to you first. You have the morning light favorite endlessly. Look, coming out of the Breeders' Cup, but ran a very nice race uh, last time out at Golden Gate on the synthetic. I'm sure being uh, on the synthetic, that's the race you're trying to key in on here. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, one thing I want to do, too, I want to propose something because I, I – you know, oh, we're all going to okay. be at the Derby and we're all going to be at the Derby, you know, and, you know, maybe one of these horses will end up being there. But if one of us or tell me we could flip it the opposite way, whoever comes in, la you know, our top pick comes in last, whatever, whoever wins this race with their bet has to pay for the tab at Jeff Ruby's. If we go there the night of the Derby. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> oh. Oh man, uh, you know the po no. the pocket. Well, let me check my pocketbook. Here. Well, oh, well, well, God damn. If Sierra Leone wins. I think we're all gonna beg well, to pay for the tab. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> if Sierra Leone wins, then it, then will be a true party at freaking Jeff Ruby's. Won't want to uh, miss that one. But anyway, no. Go ahead, uh, Pat. Yeah, no. With endlessly. Listen, you know, you know, ran the British Cup Juvenile Turf two back and funny enough uh you know michael mccarthy walked by us where we were sitting you know in our beautiful seats at santa anita right at the finish mm -hmm. line you know right there um you know <laughs> it was um he was not very happy with the way you know uh jj hernandez rode that race and you know i kind of look at that as a toss and then comes back you know in on the tapita and runs really impressively against you know i'd say weaker competition um but Listen, this horse has been impressive. You know, is the morning line favorite for a reason. Um, I think we'll improve again off this last race. And, you know, the numbers are right there with everybody else. So I'm hoping the horse gets a trip because it's going to be coming from uh, the back of the pack. But um, this horse could put itself in good spot to be uh, running on the first Saturday in May. Well, and Patrick, I'll go to you noted here. I mean, this is a horse who's been running on turf the whole time as I bring up the time form. You'll see, again, another, I felt like I've said it every time I've broken record at this point. Another very fast pace headed by the 3, 6, and 12. Charlie has the 6 on top, but noted in the back there. Um, then you have um, the number 10 endlessly also towards the back, including with my pick, and number 9 sees the gray. So another fast pace to run into, Noah, and noted looks to be the beneficiary of that. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. I really have no idea in this race. There's more horses <laughs> that I don't. There's more horses that I don't like than I do like in this race. Yeah. Um, sure. But with noted, I think you can just kind of excuse the the last effort in the kitten's joy. And if you kind of toss that race, um, he's just kind of throwing throwing a, a collection of pretty good efforts. Um, so I think the move here is is a little interesting. And then I'll just go off with the with my last two because we got our guest waiting. Yep. Uh, lucky Jeremy, I've gotten second, who I think could be the speed of the speed. And I like the way that he's worked the, the, the two times that he's been at Turfway. I think he's kind of, uh, liking the synthetic and then dancing groom was one who's running some really nice races kind of on the Derby trail. I think gets into an easier spot and he might get a pace set up. So I've got those two underneath. Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense. Charlie, you have the number six Northern flame. And this is one that looks to be, excuse me. It looks to be towards the front for McPeak. Um, did the pace scenario bother you at all with this horse, or were you kind of seeing Northern Flame slot in here? Look, I have no issue just being brutally honest to our audience. I originally had Agate Road on top, and then after that scratch happened, I was going to put the ton on top, but then I just bragged about not taking a single favorite. And I had the six and third, so I had to move the six on top. Look, I still think I, I still think Northern Flame is absolutely live. This would be a horse I think can win, or at least be underneath. Uh, you know, I, even in some of the hotter paces this horse has dealt with. Uh, Northern Flame has been able to, you know, finish somewhere in the money. Um, I mean, look, the, the the real question ultimately will come down to because I don't think this horse is the speed of the speed. Is will Northern Flame be able to show the ability to sit just off and actually hang in there? Obviously, this horse tried doing that in the Rebel, and uh, I don't want to say it was completely empty because the horse still stayed on for third, but obviously, it just wasn't going to be able to keep up with Timberlake, who just powered down the stretch. So. I mean, I do think from that angle, if the horse can, if Northern Flame, you know, can, if he can sit a similar trip and stay up, could still get it done. Obviously, we talked enough about the 10. Uh, and then the 8, Otello. Look, I think this horse is interesting. I was against this horse last time out just because I thought 
there wasn't much value. And if you were looking for someone to play under near, underneath fierceness, I didn't think this was the horse to go with. But I still acknowledge that the two efforts before that were very solid. Beat a horse that, you know, Kyle, you and I hold near and dear in first world war, a horse that you and I have always advocated for. So Atello certainly has the talent. And again, I think the trip works out very nicely for Atello. I, I would, this would be the horse I'd probably place a win bet on from a price point perspective. And I like the fact that, you know, this horse will probably get the first jump on uh, as opposed to endlessly on the speed. I mean, the horse was second choice to fierceness in the Holy Bull. And now it shows 15 to one on the morning line here, granted on a completely different surface. But I mean, you're looking from a value standpoint, Otello could be your horse to go with. I went with the number nine sees the gray guys completely piggybacking off that last race. And I understand, you know, before that, his numbers were all over the place and he hasn't, hasn't really shown too much talent in those previous races. The last time, guys, first race at three years old, I think D. Wayne Locust really figured out this horse. Now coming back, granted, my race, you know, the my race horse money is going to be there for this horse. So, you know, six to one is probably going to be the most you'll get on Seize the Gray. But sitting a nice stalking trip, we'll get the jump on a lot of horses coming from the back, i.e., you know, noted and uh, endlessly and all that type of stuff. Seize the Gray can get a jump on those just like he did last time in that Oaklawn Park uh, optional claiming. I think he's got a very, very good chance to win this race and be in the Derby come the first Saturday in May. But guys, let's go straight to best bets here. Like I said, as we have our very gracious guest waiting as I appreciate him um, waiting, waiting his time out. And then we'll go through to uh, March Madness, which don't go anywhere because it's going to be a fantastic um conversation i'm going 9 10 3 patrick's going 10 8 4 charlie's going 6 10 8 and noah's going 4 3 2 guys let's move on straight to our best bets here and who i have first i have noah going up first so noah race number nine double two four nine with three assuming dutching those and a race 11 in the bourbon at oaks a win on the number two you're 10 to one winnable noah talk about your best bets yeah so in race nine i i would dub i would dutch those doubles um if botanical is going to be, you know, four to five, I might not even consider that just because that double might not pay very well. Uh, but I, I would definitely use definitely chop, uh, chop, chop and um, the four who I have forever after all on top. Uh, and then moving on to race 11, where I think Alpine Princess and a couple of others are a little bit vulnerable. I want a little bit of a price, which is not a, a bad angle to take here at Turfway. So I'm going up with the with the other McPeak, which is the two winnable, I think can move uh, forward off that uh, maiden score. So those are my two best bets. They said, I mean, look, 10 to 1 for your best bet. I don't disagree with you, but I mean, it's maybe a little boss reverse key try in for winnable as well. And the, look, you know me, I love a good Dutch double. So, Noah, good luck with your best bets. Patrick, you're going to go up next. Your race number eight, a win in the number 10, Legri, so who we liked a lot. And a race number 12, a win in the number 10, endless Eden. Patrick, talk about your two win bets. Yeah, you know, Legri, you know, that, that horse 12 to 1 morning line has, just, you know, been very impressed. Um, you know, last race, like I said earlier, came back very strong. So I'm um, happy to take that price on the horse. And then endlessly, you know, I, I mean, I hit on the horse before, but I, I just think that is the morning line favorite, but should be really impressive uh, in this spot. And hopefully, you know, get enough points to be in the race for the Kentucky Derby racing against our boy Sierra. Yeah, no, I mean, no kidding. Endlessly, look, if he continues to improve off that last race and also on the synthetic from Golden Gate, definitely looks to fit in here with the rest of them. So, Patrick, good luck with your best bets. Charlie, going to you next. Double in race starting race number nine, two with 112 in a race number uh, 11 because I'm not smart, apparently. Didn't race race number 10. But either way, uh, win on number five, moving on up, who, like you said, was your long shot play of the sequence. Yeah, so again, you and I touched on a lot, Kyle. We love Chop Chop, uh, and I'm playing into yeah my Wesley Ward. I understand uh, the the you know the hate with the bias or whatever, but again, a lot of people in the chat did acknowledge that this could set up perfectly for the one. So for me, again, am I right with my top pick, Grape? And in a race that's pretty open, either way, I'm taking two horses that aren't the favorite, and in the first leg, again, not taking the favorite. So great value there. And then yeah, for my long shots, the other one I'd actually even throw in there is you kind of touched on is Otello at fifteen to one to me is absurd. I think that horse should be closer to like six to eight to one maybe. So I would say that's a third one I'd throw in there. But yeah, moving on up again, I think that race is open. The horse is working well, continuing to take step for, steps forward after the trainer switched to Safi, and uh, again could sit a nice trip and with another step forward could certainly win at a price. And like I, we've all kind of touched on, plenty of these favorites deserve to be favorites, but also seem very beatable. 
Well, and like I said, you touched on um, the Chop Chop race and the um, with the 112. The Kentucky, the Kentucky Cup Classic is such a hard race. And then in the Bourbon at Oaks, if you don't like uh, number one Alpine Princess, there's a lot of different ways you can go. Moving on up at 12 to 1 as Charlie touched on his long shot play of the day. So good luck, Charlie, with your best bets. And guys, you guys are going to hate me for one of these best bets, but I really think he's got a good chance, and I think you know where I'm leaning in here. Race number seven, I I really think Shards has a really good chance. If he's five to two, I'd be willing to take every part of that five to two. Anything less than that, I don't. Coming off a layoff, I don't know if anything less than five to two, I'd be willing to take on him. But I know I'm going to get riddled in the comments for this one. But um, I have to take him on top. I really think he has a good chance with the pace scenario. Noah, quit your shut the. Oh, uh, race number 10, guys. This is a, um, this is the one with Wolfie Dynaghost. I really think if he gets out to the lead at all, I think he's got a massive, massive chance on top. And then going with um, Alpine Princess and the number six, Band of Gold, who I talked about in the Bourbon at Oaks, I think those are your two most likely winners. And if you're getting anywhere near six to one, eight to one on those doubles, getting those two um, lower prices, I feel like really shapes up. Um, really well for you coming down uh, the stretch. No pun intended as I'm getting absolutely throttled in our private chat to the right here, but I knew that was going to come. I d- there's just, there's a lot of these turfway races guys are really hard. And the fact that you have to kind of narrow it down, I feel like your double or your pick three is your best way to cover a lot of your, um, a lot of bets while still being able to cover a lot of horses. Getting six to one, eight to one, there's nothing wrong with that in a double, especially if you really have strong opinions on horses such as Chop Chop or Wolfie's Dino Ghost. Maybe even play a pick three. I would play Chop Chop into Wolfie's Dino Ghost into two or three horses in the Bourbon at Oaks. I think there's a lot of different ways you can go with races in this spot. But good luck to all of you playing the Jeff Ruby Stakes card at Turfway and tomorrow's show for picks and ponies covering the louisiana derby days that's going to be another fantastic card um for it so that's going to cover our horse racing segment on today's card but real quick guys don't go anywhere because we're going to cover a very very obviously what everyone looks to this time of year march madness we're going to cover the entire bracket um down to all the all our best bets in every region and then a wrap up at the end covering our best bets for the entire weekend and maybe even some win um some championship winners going forward as i know charlie and our guest will have plenty of those covered as i bring up the bracket right now as we'll go through um all these different um but first guys i want to bring on our guest and this is a guy that um can be pl- completely honest i met at a bar he's a fellow wisconsin knight but he has a podcast i they do it they do a really great job covering college basketball as they've done um, it's a pretty new podcast starting up this year, but they've got a, a lot of good information. And like I said, I feel like I felt like it was a really good opportunity to bring him on here to cover March Madness. So from the Pump Fake Podcast and at Stooley Picks on Twitter, Trevor. Trevor, what's going on, my man? Oh, big muted. Unlucky. Oh, uh, strike one. I'm, for the I'm guest. notorious for that. That's my bad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, and like I said, Trevor's um, the first time I ever met him was he was drinking at the bar and cheering on a hundred and fifty dollar Boise State to cover in the um, in oh god, what the conference are they in? I cannot I remember. remember the, uh, they're the in the Mountain, Mountain West, West conference. I forget yeah. what game it was. But, it, it was um, yeah. the game against um, oh, was, they were on they were in, they were plus seven in that. Either way, he had a hundred and fifty dollar bet on Boise State to cover, and I'm like, you know what? This guy fits in pretty well with what we're trying to do here. <laughs> Obviously, betting and boozing. So, Trevor, welcome in, man. Like I said, greatly appreciate you coming on. And let's talk some basketball here. So, the first region that we're going to cover, guys, is the East region. And headed by UConn, um, last year's winner and notorious Charlie. Oh, I would have bet him if I didn't fall asleep or whatever he says. But um, and now, that's not and, what happened. That's not what oh, happened. The oh, sorry, sorry. Alarm- Pa- I have an email proof. The fire, fire alarm. alarm went off in my dorm when I was giving them out at 25 plus 2,500. I had them in my final four. I don't want to talk about it. We move. We move. It's a yeah, new year. We, yeah, yeah. You're not getting 22 to 1 this year. I'll tell you that much. 
on no, UConn no. to win. But guys, real quick before we um before we go into the regions, I want to promote the March Madness pool again, guys. Uh, the Ben and Booze in his March Madness pool is back, of course, as I touched on at the start of the show. In the link in the description, you'll find uh, on YouTube, on the YouTube show, um, which if you're watching on Twitter, you can find um, through the video. There's a, On the bottom right, it says view on YouTube, and you can go through there to get to the description. The link is down below. You win If you come on top, uh, if you, I keep saying that, and I've got to watch myself. Um, <laughs> if you win the pool, you are going to get a free $50 and free merch. And if you're subscribed to the HHH Racing Podcast Power Picks, which is, of course, our great horse racing power pick uh, picks tip sheet, you will get an your payout will double. So you get $100 and free merch. Again, the password is capital B, lowercase n, capital B, 2024. The link to that is in the description of the YouTube channel. But guys, let's move into the East region here, headed by UConn, of course. Uh, up next is FAU Northwestern. Charlie says, boo, booey, we trust. San Diego State UAB, which I know is a game a lot of people are keying in, and Auburn, Yale, BYU, Duquesne, Duquesne, I think. Duquesne, Duquesne. Duquesne. It's Duquesne? Is that really, were, were that French It's, right it's here? Duquesne, it's Duquesne. Duquesne, Duquesne. As, as an A-10 advocate, it's Duquesne, <laughs> get it right. Yeah, yeah, A-10 Duke advocate, whatever you say. Illinois, Moorhead State, Washington State, Drake, and Iowa State, South Dakota State. Trevor, I'm going to go to you first, my friend, and we'll kind of go bounce off ideas off you. And as we go through, um, as he gives his uh, picks, uh, Charlie, Noah, Patrick, feel free to jump in on anything he says and kind of bounce ideas back off him. We'll move out in this way. Trevor, any games that kind of stick out to you in the East region? Um, I, I think there's a lot of interesting matchups here. Um, first off, uh, who, whoever said they were on Boo Booey, uh, I, I love Boo Booey. I'm a, I'm a Big Ten guy, but um, they lost Ty Berry, and it's kind of just been it, – it's all on his shoulders. Um no Barnheiser and Langboard can they'll be all right, but um, I, I think I know FAU. Everyone's kind of shat on them all year. They they don't deserve to be an eight seed whatsoever. They're overseeded one hundred percent, but they've they've got the experience in this situation and, and they're fully healthy and they have um, a full full array of guards and uh, big men down low that they can rotate in and out. So um, I like them to take the Northwestern there, but um, UAB San Diego State's an interesting matchup. Um, UAB matches up pretty nicely with them. Um, with uh, Yaxel uh, Landenberg, which is a great name, and then uh, Christian <laughs> Coleman, another big guy. Um, their coach Andy Kennedy is fantastic. Uh, Eric Gaines is, is is a takeover guy, so I think they can give San Diego State a little bit of a battle. Um, San Diego State was 100% defense last year, and we saw it when they uh, saw you or played UConn. Um, they couldn't score for shit. Um, granted, a lot of teams couldn't, but um, it really came to the forefront. They didn't have a bucket getter. Um, Ladies great this year, but um, they they really don't have a, a dangerous three point threat that uh, can really uh, scare you at any time here. But um, I've got UAB. Um, this, if I had to gun to my head, I'm going to take San Diego State to win. But I think UAB can cover that game. Um, I have Auburn taking down Yale. Um, they just rotate too many guys. Um, have the size, um, the athleticism. Uh, they run and gun the whole time. So um, if they're not hitting shots and Yale is slowing them down. Um, they, they could give them an issue, but I don't see Auburn, um, not scoring. Um, they're going to get turnovers. They're going to run in transition, um, play physical defense. Um, a guy on Yale to watch for Danny Wolf. He's awesome. He's a seven footer that can, that can take the ball. He's crossed up guards. He can, he can spin, he can handle the ball. So he, he's fun to watch. Um, and then moving on down, um, I think there's a, a lot of upset potential here. Um, Duquesne, they can, uh, they can shut your water off from three. Um, they can take that away from you, which is where BYU thrives. Um, they're uh, one of the top teams in the country when it uh, comes to shooting threes and, and scoring from the three. 41.2% um, of their points, um, which is uh, second in the country. So um, mm -hmm. if they're not getting that, they're not uh, they're not scoring much. So um, I think Duquesne can give them a little bit of an issue. Um, and not to mention uh, Classic March is a little storyline. Um, to go along, there's uh, Coach Damrot, their uh, their coach. He's he's actually retiring um, uh, at the end of this year, and uh, they just went and won the uh, conference tournament. So um, I think maybe they'll have a little bit of a motivating factor in that one. Um, I'm I have them plus eleven already. I think they're going to cover the spread here. Um, not to mention, be an early start time for BYU. 
for mountain time. So they'll be already two hours uh, before tip off or normal body clocks. So um, that could be an issue. And then uh, also Moorhead State can give uh, Illinois a, a little bit of problems, I think. Um, you look at Illinois, they were trailing 10 points in every single Big Ten game and uh, conference tournament game yep. and came in, came back and, and won every game. Um, granted, Terrence Shannon Jr. was, was takeover mode. I think he had like almost 100 points in those three games. So um, he has that capability. But Moorhead State, they can, uh, they'll slow you down. They have the, they match up size wise, they play great defense. Um, Illinois struggles to stop, uh, stop scoring whatsoever. I mean, they let up a ton of points. That's it's just every game they play is just over city because they don't play defense. They just they just score. Um, so um, not a big fan of that. I mean, Damascus and Hawkins, they can take over, but they didn't play too well in the Big Ten tournament. Um, so we'll see how, how they step up here. Um, Moorhead will keep it interesting. Um, I haven't bet it yet, but I'm debating about betting them um, to cover the spread and then potentially upsetting Illinois. Um Fat and happy went in the Big Ten. Now you're going to play a 14 seed. Um, and, you know, they, they fall behind and don't play defense. So, I mean, if, if Moorhead can, can score, slow them down, force them into limited possessions, that's going to be that's gonna be hell for Illinois potentially. But when you got Terrence Shannon, um, you're never out of the game. That's the, yep. that's the thing. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Washington State, I have, I have them beating Drake. Drake's awesome. Uh, great story. But they have a lot of coaching uh, rumors swirling around um, – uh, the coach DeVries um, and he's, you know, he's rumored to be taking P five jobs. So we'll uh, yeah, there we go. There, you know how it is. Um, so I don't know about his focus there and in Washington state, their, their point guard, Miles Rice. Um, we, you'll hear about, he beat leukemia last year and he he's coming back. So um, he played a great year. So that'll be a good story, but he played the worst game he's played almost all of his career and they barely lost to Colorado uh, in the PAC 12 tournament. So, I don't think that's going to repeat itself. I think they're they're going to show up and and Washington State was was picking off teams left and right in the Big Twelve and uh in their uh, fu mode um and the on the way out of the conference with everyone else. So um, I like them to get Drake here and then South Dakota State will keep it uh, interesting against Iowa State for a little bit, but Iowa State's going to suffocate them and just just crush them. Um, so moving on, I have uh, Iowa State. Um, Duquesne or uh, Illinois, sorry. I have Illinois and uh, Auburn and FAU actually in my um, Sweet 16. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm taking the experience of FAU. They've been in here before. Um, they have the exact same team. They have, you know, elite guard play. Um, UConn, everyone's already kind of penciled into have won the whole damn thing. So I don't really know why we're going to play all these games, but let's <laughs> find out what happens. Um, so I, I, I think uh, also the factor that FAU was a buzzer beater away from San Diego State from playing UConn last year for a national title, yeah. um, which would have been a way better game. So I <laughs> think they have a little bit of motivation there to get that. And then, you know, if San Diego State makes it, they could get a rematch in the Sweet 16 against San Diego State. So no kidding. Um, I've got Char- FAU making the big uh, upset here. Yeah. And Charlie, you know, how do you feel about that one considering um, talking about we've talked about Northwestern so many times and you've watched them go up in flames and absolutely rip people to shreds on this show. Um, going with FAU, Trevor is, and he's got a good point, though. Northwestern is a little bit banged up. Yeah, no, Ty Berry's been out for a while. He's the energizer on our on our team. Uh, great three-point shooter, really kind of makes a difference maker. I think the bigger issue, though, is not him being out. It's Matt Nicholson. Uh, FAU is, I can't think of the guy's first name. I know his last name's Golden. I'm not going to try pronouncing his first, but he's a seven-foot monster. So I know with Matt Nicholson being out, we could be in trouble. But the reality is Northwestern plays slower basketball. They don't turn the ball over. They're a very disciplined team. They're a much better defensive team, in my opinion, than FAU. I think FAU, yes, they moved to a bigger conference. Uh, You know, they started out looking good in the year. They beat uh, one of the biggest frauds, in my opinion, in Arizona. But it's still a big program win for them. Uh, But I kind of look at FAU the other way around. I mean, I think whoever wins is going to get blown out by UConn. I think Northwestern's slow pace would make them actually more dangerous for UConn because they're not used to playing teams that like to play as slow as them. Uh, But I think people forget FAU was also seconds away from getting eliminated in the first round of Memphis if they didn't have a horrible collapse. Uh, But I also think FAU's talented. They're my home away from home because my grandparents uh, live five minutes off campus. So it's kind of a conflicting between two cool stories. Uh, As we move down the bracket, I'll go pretty quickly. I think San Diego State's a matchup nightmare for UAB. Um, 
I just think their defense is locked down. Ladi is a stud. And, uh, you know, last year I had them in my uh, Elite Eight playing UConn. I mean, playing uh, Creighton. So that was pretty cool to see happen. But I think they're great. I think Auburn, unfortunately, is a matchup nightmare for them. Uh, Auburn, all the analytics show Auburn is this year's UConn. Uh, they were horribly, horribly, horribly underseeded. That Auburn team has the ability of a two seed, but should have gotten a three seed. And somehow they end up in a four. Uh, an interesting fact about this region I think is cool is three of the final four teams from last year are in this region. The only one not Miami just didn't make the tournament. Uh, and I know we kind of touched on it a little bit, but I think a, a team to watch out for, even though I think Illinois will go far, I think Moorhead State is a disaster matchup for them. Moorhead State is a very disciplined team. Uh, you know, they were supposed to dominate the Ohio Valley, but had injuries earlier in the year and then started to get healthy and dominated their tournament. Uh, I think the guy to watch out for is Riley Minix. He's a six foot seven guard slash forward that can literally do it all. And they are one of the slowest teams in the country in pace, like painfully slow while Illinois wants to go and score 90. So I think if Illinois can survive them, I think it's smooth sailing. I think them and BYU play similar, but Illinois is better and more athletic players. Uh, Iowa State, I think is good, but is upset. It could be a big victim to be in an upset simply because of, you know, yes, they're a very defense team like Houston, but uh, their offense can also dry up. But I think Drake's very interesting. I think Washington State, who's a team I've liked, they've kind of gone a little cold down the stretch, and they're another team that can struggle to get buckets. Tucker DeVries is a stud, and if you want to talk about someone wanting to get revenge, when they blew it last year after having that lead against Miami, he played the worst game of his career, and I think he's going to come out in blood. And that game also in Omaha is sort of a home game for them in Iowa State. They're a team I'd watch out for that could go on a run. But ultimately, I think that this region runs through UConn and Auburn. Uh, and one of those two teams is going to get through that region. And the winner of that game is going to the Final Four. And speaking of that, you know, you get a big guest coming on for Sweet 16. That could be your matchup right there is uh, Auburn-UConn for that Sweet 16 spot, which would be a really cool game to obviously cover. But, Patrick, no, anything else before we move on regions? No, I think UConn's, uh, you know, I've seen them in person a couple times this year. Uh, playing St. John's, they're a well-doiled machine. I, I wouldn't be trying to beat them uh, to get out of the, that region, especially you know. I mean, I know people have talked about it. They, they're not going to have to travel far at all to you know to go places until they got to go to the Final Four. So I, I just they're very good, and I don't think they're going to get beat. Yeah, yeah, I think if if UConn and Auburn do end up matching up in the Sweet Sixteen, it really wouldn't surprise me if one of those teams ended up making it to the Final Four. I mean, going off of, yeah, I mean, as we, as Trevor brought up, which is a really good point, and Charlie did as well, you know, this Auburn team has really been um, a force, and then the fact that they get down to a four seed is kind of, you know, Charlie said, you know, it's a little bit disrespectful as per what he's saying, but um, I think they have a pretty good run at it. Granted, they're going to have to run into the tournament favorites, and from what I saw today, 25% of people have on uh, winning their bracket right now, which I mean, you know, out of a 64 tournament team, even though they're a one seed, that's a pretty high uh, amount of people picking them to win. So I think the East is, I think that's pretty good. I think Iowa state could be one to, or Illinois could even make a run if they continue to, if they finally, you know, find a way to actually start the game, not behind by 20 points, but um, is that that one definitely runs through. UConn and see how far they will go. But guys, we'll move on to the West region here, which we're going down the bracket. Obviously, run through the North Carolina one seed and the two seed in Arizona, who I know Charlie has already touched on a little bit. Um, has a few uh big opinions on mm -hmm. Arizona. But Trevor, obviously, we'll go to you first here, my friend. What what are a couple games that kind of stick out to you in this spot and where um where your best bets kind of land in this region? Uh Man, I have a Grand Canyon. Just all year, I've been a fan of them. Um, they kind of hit a little low in the beginning, the middle of the year. But this is a, this team is elite. Like they get to the line more than Purdue does, um, which which is a, a crazy. And that's that's where you win games in March too, is making your free throws and getting to the line and and making shots. But I I think they can upset St. Mary's. I know St. Mary's has has been good, but I don't think they've been their usual good self. Um, I mean, we did kind of ask her, ask it, at least I did in the middle of the year if they're as good. And I don't think they're, they're a great team, but I don't think they're nearly as good as they usually are. Um, Gonzaga also, um, in this division, well, side anyway, uh, but Grand Canyon, I, I think they, they're going to get to the line. Tyson Foster, Grant, everyone's going to, or Grant Foster, everyone's going to know his name after this. Um, McLaughlin, um, Bryce Drew with Scott Drew's brothers, the head coach. Um, so, I mean, he's got, um, 
he's got a, his brother. If he'd ever had questions, he helped him out. And he, they've been dominating at Grand Canyon. So um, I actually have Grand Canyon going to the Sweet 16 here. Um, also, I'm a little I'm a little nervous and afraid. I've been hearing a lot of New Mexico talk um, the last couple of days. Um, I'm high on New Mexico. I think they have one of the top five backcourts in the country between House Mashburn and Dent, uh, Mashburn Jr. and Dent. Um, which is another key to March is just having great guards. Um, they do, and not to mention they got Nelly Jr. Joseph and JT Toppin down low, so so they can bang with guys and, and score. Um, they like to play fast tempo too. Um, so I, I have them beating Clemson. Um, I, I'm scared. I, I think Clemson could potentially match up good. I mean, Joe Girard, when he's on, he can he can torch the nets, and then PJ Hall can can go dummy too, but. Um, in New Mexico coming off of the Mountain West Championship. Maybe they're a little a little tired, dead-legged yet, but um, I, I think they're going to beat Clemson here. And then um, I I have them losing to Baylor. Um, I, I went back and forth, but um, it's not like New Mexico plays a ton of defense either. Um, they're, they're very fast-paced. Lately, their defense has been better, yes, um, but that's also the, you know, you see teams for the third potentially, you know, uh, X amount of times in the conference. So I think that has a little bit of familiarity that, that helped them out there, but um, Baylor's an elite jump shooting team. They can score, um, but when they're off, they're off, but um, it's going to be Ray J. That'd be Ray J. Dennis first uh, house. And I, I would just give the uh, advantage slightly to Baylor there, but um, yeah, in this division or conference, I mean, I don't, I went back and forth on Alabama Charleston. I don't know if Charlie's got an opinion on that one, but um I lean Charleston in that just because they've been playing defense um, and they can score too. They play fast pace and um, they blew a game here uh, last year too, similar to Drake. So um, they've got now a motivating factor. Alabama doesn't, doesn't care to play defense similar to Kentucky. Um, so they just running and gunning, you know, if you make it, we're going to take the ball and run the other, other side and try to outscore you. So um, I think we could see a 12, 13 upset or uh, match up here. And then uh, ultimately, um, I have Baylor beating Grand Canyon um, in the uh, to come out of this one, but I also have Michigan State beating North Carolina. Um, I went back and forth on Michigan State actually losing to Mississippi State, but um, I think Izzo in the tournament he's he's been really good, and I can't remember the exact number, but something in the second round he's got a ridiculous record as well. Um, and North Carolina they they're very RJ Davis reliant. Um, he goes for thirty points and. Um, you know, that helps him out a ton. Baycott, I don't think is, as he's got all the stats, but I don't think he's as good as everyone hypes him up to be. Um, and Harrison Ingram has been great, but Michigan state, when they put it together, they really put it together and they can play really well. So, um, I'm going to give the edge to Izzo there over Davis, uh, Hubert and company. So Michigan state losing to grand Canyon. Yeah. I kind of got a upset heavy region here, but I don't see, um, I see a lot of great guard play and, and, and kind of suspect yeah. uh, defenses. At, at but the thing is, is that that's what people love to hear, right? They want to hear when those upsets come in. So Trevor has it coming in the West bracket. Charlie, I know he kind of pointed out to you about our Alabama Charleston, but again, I know you have some pretty heavy opinions here in this, um, in this region. Yeah, this is, I mean, look, this is by far and away the weakest region. It's a, it's a bunch of overseeded teams that aren't that good. Uh, so that's why you can, you know, assume for chaos. I think this is, I've, you know, I've talked to one of my friends who's the biggest Michigan State fan I know that knows all about them. And uh, he kind of agrees with what I think. You know, this team could easily just bow out to a North Carolina team that's overrated simply because they're not very good. Or they could take advantage of a weak bracket and Izzo could light a fire under them and get this team all the way to the Elite Eight. I, I think either way is very realistic. I think it could honestly even admit it. It could be as bad as, you know, as Trevor touched on, this team could just bow out to Mississippi State. For me, my issue with Michigan State is normally, even if these Izzo teams aren't great, you know, we saw last year, I was actually at the game when they upset Marquette. That Michigan State team wasn't great, but then once March came and the Big Ten tournament came, they woke up and they showed up and Izzo is March, which you know normally doesn't start in March Madness. It starts when the month of March starts and all those down the stretch games in the regular season where they need to solidify their status. MSU kind of got gifted. I mean, them getting a nine seed being safely in is crazy in itself. They should have been a play-in team. I don't believe in this MSU team at all. I think they can take Mississippi State. They got a very favorable draw and it's two teams that are defensive based that can't score so they can kind of get away with it but I think against North Carolina especially when MSU's had trouble with the five position all year they don't know who to play at center because they don't have any I think Baycott could dominate them so I think they're going to bow out early 
I love St. Mary's this year. They went 15 and one and won their conference. They're having one of the best years they've ever had after a brutal start to the regular season. Uh, you know, trying to figure out all their new guys, how to make their system work. But, uh, you know, Randy Bennett has them really playing well and they've been dominant down the stretch. They took two out of three against Gonzaga. I can't think of the last time they've been able to do that. And I think they got a very uh, favorable sector of four because you have Grand Canyon who wants to play fast. You have Alabama and Charleston who don't play defense and want to play fast. Playing a St. Mary's team that's one of the most you know, one of the slower, more efficient teams in the entire country. I think they're going to wreak havoc on that sector. I think North Carolina is just a little too athletic and that duo, you know, with, uh, you know, their guard and center duo could just be too much for St. Mary's, but I also could see St. Mary's get as far as the elite eight. Uh, I actually also love Charleston. Um, you know, last year when they played San Diego state, who was a matchup nightmare and in theory should have killed them because they play lockdown defense. They were able to get their style and enforce it on them anyway. I think Alabama, you know, like Trevor touched on, they're similar to Kentucky, but Kentucky wants to play defense. Like we saw it in the Auburn game when they upset them on the road. They just, Coach Cal can't always get them to. Alabama plays like an AAU team that you're seeing when you see all these guys that just want to be in the highlight reels in the films. This Alabama team has no interest in playing defense. I saw them play Florida, who, I mean, I was close. I had them at plus 2,000 to win the SEC. They got the doors beaten off them, and they didn't care. They were happy to go down 20 points and just – pack it in. They've been terrible down the stretch. They lost Al They lost to Tennessee at home in a game that could have been a huge statement for them. I just see a disinterested team that just wants to score. I think Charleston could very well upset them. I get that they play the same style. I think St. Mary's would have this Alabama team in hell either way, so I think that's an upset. You know, something I always tell people is if you think this team's going to struggle in the second round anyway and you think an upset's possible, you might as well take it. Um, I love New Mexico over Clemson. I think Clemson might be the most overseeded team in the field. They're in an awful ACC team or conference and got absolutely embarrassed. And I think New Mexico is underrated. Uh, but Baylor is a Final Four level team when they play at their best. And it's coming out of the most difficult conference in the Big 12. So I think they can go on a run and watch out for Arizona. And I don't mean this in a good way. I think they can get to Baylor, but I think Nevada is a matchup nightmare for them. They don't like playing teams that are efficient, that defend well and slow you down and can make threes. Nevada does all those things. And this is a Nevada team that went from being completely out of the picture to dominant down the stretch all the way to come in the two seed in a Mountain West that I believe is for real this year. Uh, so I'd watch out for Nevada if you're looking for the double digit seed that could go on a run. Uh, but yeah, I like Baylor out of that region, actually. I mean, like I said, Trevor likes Baylor as well. I mean, he was the one that touched on um, having Baylor go all the way to the at least the lead eight, if not the final four, if I remember correctly, Trevor. But, um, yeah, I mean, they have Jacoby Walter, too. He's going to be a lottery pick. Um, I don't watch NBA, so I don't – once these guys leave, I never see him again. But he, he he's really good. He's going to be elite. And uh, like Charlie said, I have Nevada – uh, beating Arizona in like half of my brackets too, because I'm like it's gonna Arizona's gonna bow out before um, the Elite Eight, so it's it's just a matter of who, and I, it's either Baylor or Nevada, and I think Nevada's a, a good option too. I mean, Keenan Blackshear, dude's just physically imposing as a guard. He can he can make life hell for for um, Caleb uh, Caleb Love. So no, absolutely, and like I said. We mentioned that it's a pretty heavy uh, – we think it's a pretty heavy upset division, kind of the weakest region out of them all. So it's definitely one one way you can uh, you can go and maybe take a lot of spreads to cover. And obviously we'll get to that at the end of the conversation as we wrap this up. But we'll go pretty quick here, guys. Uh, we are going a little bit longer, but I appreciate the viewership. We've had constant viewership and it only continues to go up as we continue to talk about March Madness. So greatly appreciate everybody joining in here through Twitter and through YouTube. But we'll go pretty quick here. We'll kind of highlight a couple games that Trevor and Charlie are keying in on, and then we'll move on to the Midwest region and then wrap it up with best bets and um, best bets and maybe tournament futures. But Trevor, of course, going to you, South region, headed by Houston as number one. Marquette, who a lot of people I know like and have some very strong opinions on. Kentucky is also the three seed in this, included with Duke. I mean, just a whole lot of big names, not necessarily the best teams that they brought to the tournament in the most recent years, but this is one, I think a lot the South is going to be the one uh, region that's going to get a lot of talk. Yeah. I mean, a lot of big name schools, Houston, Duke, uh, Kentucky, Florida, Marquette. I mean, yeah, big, big names here, but um, yeah, Houston, they just got, they got smashed by Iowa State, but that was that was damn near a home game for Iowa State, and and we know the defense that they play, and they they slow you down and make life hell, um, which I think could create an interesting matchup between A and M and Houston in the uh, round of thirty two. There, Houston will slow you down, grind you out, uh, crash the glass. They have great guard play too, so 
Um, that'll be that'll be a really interesting matchup. Um, another one here. I mean, you guys know I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm a Badgers fan. So um, they've got James Madison, which one that's you know James Madison's a damn good team. Uh, that's everyone's favorite twelve over five upset mm-hmm. that I've seen. I don't think I've seen a soul pick Wisconsin. Um, so I mean, out of out of fandom, I'm picking them to win. But to cover the spread, I think it'll be a very close game. James Madison does a lot um, really well. Um, Wisconsin, they've they, they've always got a seven minute scoreless drought in them, um, even with AJ uh, Store uh, on the floor and, and Chucky. But they'll they'll have some size advantage with Crowell down low they can step out so i i think wisconsin ultimately gets it done but james madison can cover and maybe even upset him i wouldn't be shocked one bit so um there's that but otherwise the, the really the only other early upset i see in this one would be um i think boise is going to beat colorado tonight and then i think boise actually beats florida as well um florida lost pretty bad injury their 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 big man down low um to a fractured leg or ankle or something but mm-hmm. it wasn't good um so he he's gone and then we saw what happened when he left they they kind of hung in a little bit but they just got punished um and it was it was a runaway from there boise has has size down low and then even if colorado wins they have size down low that can that can bully ball and, and own the paint um not to mention they got great guards on both teams max rice on boise is liable to to light it up any night of the week so um and and DJ and Hart, Omar Stanley, they, they've got dudes. So I think that'll be an upset. Otherwise, I think it'll be fairly forward in this this one. Um, Vermont, they're an interesting matchup, but just Becker never has success really in March here in the, in the big tournament. So I think in the end of the day, it'll be a, a Duke Wisconsin little national title rematch there. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, James Madison could easily upset them. But um, uh, I've got I'll Houston. Be... Oh, no, go, go for, for it. it. Nope, all you guys, uh, go for it. I got Houston Duke uh, plan, and then I have Houston coming out of that, and Texas Tech uh, upsetting Kentucky. I just don't like Kentucky doesn't play defense. Texas Tech can score; um, they do play defense. Uh, Pop Pop Isaacs is electric, so um, he can turn it on. They don't have Warren Washington, uh, their big man, but they they've been playing a little bit of smaller ball and scoring more. So I think Texas Tech can give Kentucky a game with that defense and. Uh, ultimately just meet up with Houston in the uh the elite eight there well I'll know one guy that has a little bit of backlash there uh Mr. Noah yeah I wanted to ask about the cats just because I think you know I've seen a lot of experts that like them I've seen a lot of experts that really hate them um but I think the the one thing that they got going for them is they could have a different leading score every night uh you know they got the freshman weapons and they've got some experience as well um so I, I think I, I kind of wanted to see what you kind of thought their floor and their ceiling were, because when I look at it, I, I kind of think it's either Houston or them coming out of that region. So I just wanted to kind of get your quick thoughts on where they could kind of possibly end up in some certain matchups that might kind of make them a little bit vulnerable. Um, yeah, I mean, Kentucky, we've seen like they can they'll put up 120 on you. No problem. But they can also give up 117 and lose 114 to 117. So it's just yeah just the problem they have i mean they've lost some home games questionable ones um just texas a&m shooting the way they did and scoring as many points was kind of scary i mean texas a&m granted they shot lights out it was out of mind but they're 28 percent three-point shooting team and they had like clear lanes all day and they shot i think like almost 55 percent that game or something ridiculous yeah um so i mean i think i mean tech kentucky's the team where they can if they're scoring 117, they'll, they'll do it all the way to the final four and, and and whatnot. But if they have an off night or they run into, I mean, Texas Tech, that we've seen them get their doors blown off them too. So if their offense isn't going, Kentucky will will pull away just because they they'll be able to get a bucket on you eventually. But um, I think other than Texas Tech, I think Houston's probably the only other snag up for them. Um, Marquette, Kolek's been off for so long. We'll see how he plays. Um, but Shaka doesn't really have much success in this tournament. I don't think he's made the Sweet 16 in the second weekend since VCU. Um, so that's it's been a minute. So um, I think Kentucky they get snagged by Texas Tech. Otherwise, they could they could go against Houston, and that'd be a very interesting game. Um, hell of a stylistic yeah. matchup <laughs> to mm-hmm. see. So I actually hope I'm wrong and that we see Kentucky. But I just their their unwillingness or failure to play defense kind of it just scares me too much in, in the tournament in yeah. March. Yeah, I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense. And 
Charlie, real quick, anything you wanted to add on, and then we'll move to the Midwest. Go real quick through that, and then we'll kind of wrap it up here in the next five minutes, five to seven minutes. Yeah, I'll be brief. Look, I think Houston has the safest and easiest path to the Final Four. Uh, the region's talented, but I think it just from their style of play sets up perfectly that they're avoiding teams that play slow, really good defense like a, a UConn or like a Iowa State, so that works in their favor. I think JMU is a matchup nightmare for Wisconsin. I was kind of hoping they wouldn't get this good of a matchup because I figured a lot of casuals would take JMU, but I'm going to be taking them. Wisconsin does not guard the three, and they drain the three. Uh, they also play fast. Wisconsin struggles against fast teams. I think Duke is another team who's kind of similar to Wisconsin, just has better players. Uh, so I think JMU could be as dangerous as the Sweet 16. I mean, I'm not taking that risk just because Wisconsin could beat them, so I'm just picking Duke. Uh, in terms of elsewhere, uh, I like Texas Tech as well. I'm happier against NC State. I just think they're out of gas quite honestly. I think the ACC is overrated, and I think they have no emotion, nothing left. I think they're tired. Uh, I love Florida going on a run. I know they lost their big man, but the one thing that was kind of fortunate for Florida is they have great big man depth. Uh, I think Marquette, aside from their struggles that they've obviously had, even if Cole comes back, they'll never be honest about how healthy he is. I mean, from what I've been reading online, I don't buy it that he'll be as healthy as Shocker claims. I just don't think he can afford to say he's going to be playing through like 50% because teams will take advantage. I think they're the most susceptible two seed to going home in round one because Western Kentucky plays such a weird, crazy fast pace that that could kind of make anybody in trouble. Uh, I like Florida to get past Marquette, and I even think Florida could get as far as the Elite Eight because they're similar to Kentucky, but they at least play some defense, and they're better at drawing fouls and getting offensive rebounds and uh, has have caused Kentucky problems in the past. Uh, I think Houston would love to see Kentucky or Florida uh, because then they can kind of just lock them up in hell and win easy. So uh, that's why I think Houston is kind of easy in this uh, region. No, absolutely, man. Like I said, there's a whole lot of ways you can go. This one, we I think this one between the boys, I think we view it's pretty, uh, not necessarily favorite heavy, but at least towards the later end, um, I think it's really Houston, Kentucky, depending on how obviously they play defense and Marquette to go kind of through to that Elite Eight um, Final Four area. But Trevor, I'm going to give you kind of, like, we're going a little bit over, but again, our viewership is fantastic. We have almost 180 people watching live now. It's the biggest it's it's the biggest it's been all night. So again, greatly appreciate everybody watching live here. But we we'll kind of give let's say let's say let's give two or three of your best um your best upsets or picks in this type of region. I'll toss it to either Patrick or Charlie, and then we'll move on. But Patrick, are you still good to go, or do you need to leave? I'm gonna head out. But one thing, you know, this region, Purdue, I'm picking to win it all. I think they have an easy road to get to the final four in this spot. Uh, Trevor, you know, I, I just want to ask you, you know, cause I was worrying about Tennessee and stuff like that. You know, what, what's your take on Tennessee? You know, Rick Barnes has had trouble getting out of the first weekend. You know, I just, you know, I know they got a really good kid with uh, Dalton uh, connect, but uh, they seem like they're struggling a little bit. Yeah. I mean, Dalton connect, he's, he's a certified bucket getter. Um, yeah. the guy, the guy can go for 30, 40 points and no one bat an eye. Um, he's done it, but the problem is he doesn't play defense at all. Um, so that kind of, that kind of hurts Tennessee's, uh, uh, what their brand of basketball. But I mean, and you've noticed it. I mean, like when he's not guarding, I mean, it kind of throws off the rest of the defense. Cause now everyone else is thinking about, you know, roll over this way, cover anything where he could get burned on. They, they got to kind of cover it. It's it's bit him before. I mean, when he doesn't score, which it, it does happen, it's rare, but it does happen. Like it just happened in the tournament. They got blown out. Like they yeah. got destroyed. It wasn't even competitive or close the entire game. So um, I mean, granted, how much did they really care? I mean, obviously they cared, but you know, once you start you're down that much, it's like, all right, we have bigger fish to fry than a, yeah. an SEC title. So um we'll we'll see. I think I think they could they can make a run. They're kind of like ten, uh, Kentucky. I, I think if they can make a run, but um, we've seen Rick Barnes in March. I mean, it's just a, a tale as old as time. It, he's going to flare out. They're going to, they're going to die. I think he's like 500 in March or something pretty close to that uh, in the tournament ATS or uh, straight up. So, I mean, he, we'll see. I, I have a little bit more faith in them this year. I actually have them going to play Purdue in the elite eight. Um, I think we're, we're going to get a rematch there. Um, I would say my big upset in this this bracket or region would be McNeese. I know it's people like Gonzaga because of the size advantage and they've been playing great. But uh, I mean, McNeese is like similar to FAU. Who did FAU play last year? UAB, North Texas, good teams, but there were nobody schools. McNeese has played nobody. 
they went and beat Michigan before we really knew Michigan was was dog uh, dog crap. So, I mean, take that for what you want. But um, they they've still gone on on the road. They've won thirty games. Thirty winning thirty games is thirty games. It's impressive. Um, Will Wade's a great coach, and I think there's a little bit of a motivation factor if they pull off an upset over you know big name Gonzaga, potentially even Kansas. Um, that's just going to catapult him into a P five job even even quicker. Um, and those students can transfer with them. So they got a chance to play uh, P5 ball. So I think there's a little bit of a motivation factor. I have them being in Sega. Yeah. Patrick, like I said, I know you have to go. So I'm, I'll try to get you out of here. But no, nope, sorry. Well, yeah. No, you're good. <laughs> Trevor, no, you're good. Just, again, a lot of great information for the viewers out there. Patrick, one last thing before you go. Do you have anyone? You said Purdue winning it all. Do you have kind of a anyone that you're kind of keying on to make a big run that a lot of people aren't? Uh, like maybe like a big upset trying to go to the Sweet 16 or something like that before you leave. Yeah, uh, and I think Charlie could attest to it. Uh, St. Mary's, um, I, I think they're going to get a favorable road uh, with um, you know being in the UNC bracket and stuff like that. I think that region has a chance to kind of blow up and chaos can ensue. So I like St. Mary's to make the Elite Eight. That's my one big bet on a long shot. I love it, Pat. Well, like I said, have a good night, my man. Appreciate I'll you staying you on this late, but later, we'll catch you later, bro. See you guys. Yeah. All right, Charlie, wrap it up for us, and then we'll move on to our full best bets of the entire weekend and maybe and with future picks going forward. Um, any Anyone uh, stick out to you that you really think can make a run in this in this region? Yeah, I mean, I think this region is interesting because even though I said the other one's full of chaos in terms of this year, they're kind of overrated and overseeded. I mean, this region is the definition of all the frauds. I mean, I know Creighton kind of beat those allegations after last year's run, so now they're chilling but, you know, Gonzaga has always been the team that gets far but can't get it done. Purdue always collapses in March. I think Purdue and Tennessee are top two seeds. Honestly, other than the year when they played in an instant classic in that Carson Edwards game that I got was fortunate enough to see live in Louisville. Other than that year, these two teams always disappoint you. So I think it's an interesting region. Uh, I think Trevor kind of nailed it on the head. They got a very favorable draw in Purdue. I mean, I trust them to win the 16 game. But I think the biggest concern was going to be if they got a hard 8-9 game and instead they got – two overseeded teams and a Utah State team that, look, all the credit in the world to their coaching staff. They had to rebuild the entire team in one year, and they got this far. And uh, this TCU team just does nothing for me. So I think Purdue is going to avoid an early exit. Uh, I think Gonzaga's actually, we'll touch on a second, that, but one of my best bets is Gonzaga to the Sweet 16. Uh, I liked it before the news, but uh, I think McNeese has beat no one, no disrespect to them, huge year from Will Wade. Uh, I think Samford's terrible, and I think Kansas is overrated. But now with their injury, I think they could lose to Samford because they don't really have production from anyone. Samford's a smaller team that doesn't play any defense and tries to play this unrealistic, crazy fast, kind of like Alabama ball, which I think, again, as I touched on with why I think St. Mary's would be a monster um, nightmare matchup for them. Same kind of thing with Gonzaga. Uh, I actually think Gonzaga can take down Purdue. I think, I mean, uh, for people who like to hate on Gonzaga, the reality is this. They've reached eight straight Sweet 16s with Mark Few. They always do get the job done in terms of getting far. It's more so when they're trying to either get to the Final Four or when they get there and farther where they collapse. So for me, I think they could be a sneaky team that takes out Purdue simply because I think, they again, they play smart, disciplined ball. On the lower side, uh, Trevor, I'm kind of surprised with the hat. You didn't get to say much about Oregon, but uh, Dana Altman owns March. Uh, they were able to get there with an inferior team, but I think the thing people don't know about is they're starting to follow Dante, has had injury issues all year, and now he's been healthy and they've been a force to deal with. Uh, Dana Allman has never failed to reach the second round in his tenure at Oregon. Every year they've made it, they've gone that far. And actually the last uh, four, uh, the last, uh, they've made the Sweet 16 the last four times that he, they've been there, including two different times as a 12 and 7 seed, so they don't have to be a good seed. South Carolina, actually, according to Ken Palm, is the second luckiest team in the country. So I think them getting that upset is very realistic. Uh, Creighton, who's a great team, is very much so a live and die by the three teams. So when they're not making their threes, you see them get blown out by teams in the Big East. And when they make their threes like an absurd rate, like the Golden State Warriors, that's why they were able to upset UConn. So I think Creighton is very susceptible to an early exit. Uh, I love Tennessee this year. I think they have a great team. I think the reality is they played a desperate Mississippi State team whose season was on the line. And if they lost to Tennessee, they wouldn't go dancing. And I like the rest that Tennessee gets. Um, I don't think they'll win at all, but I actually have Tennessee to the final four. Uh, I will say, though, the one thing that's sneaky is I think Colorado State is not a great matchup for them. I think Colorado State is a very disciplined team that plays very well. You know, they beat the crap out of Creighton earlier in the year. 
and showed just how for real this team could be. And I think they can dispose of Texas. And I think last night a lot of people kind of didn't give them enough credit because of how god awful Virginia is. I mean, that's a disgrace in a whole nother conversation. I, you know, I had my rant last episode about the committee. Them putting in Virginia over a bunch of other teams was awful. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I have Tennessee coming out of that region against Gonzaga, but I think it's one of Purdue, Gonzaga, or Tennessee. Yeah. And look, I mean, People, you know, Kansas obviously having that injury is, is a big part of that because I know a lot of people had Kansas being a four seed going through um, to beat Purdue, which is a lot of what's a lot of people's main thing. But now getting that, you know, Purdue kind of has a little bit of an easier road all the way probably up until Tennessee. And then that will be a great game in the Elite Eight. Um, as Charlie touched on, you know, Utah State of TCU don't really bother me for them. Um, it's basically just going to be until they get to Kansas and then. The Elite Eight and Tennessee pretty much has a decent run as well. So it's kind of – I'm looking one-two as well in this type of bracket. No one really else um, jumps out at me per se, but I know a lot of these guys, um, you know, Trevor and Charlie know way – you know, they're way more into it. I'll be completely honest than I am, but I try to keep up with as much as I can. But, guys, let's move on. So out of all the four we- – what? Go for I it. I got two little, little fun fa- – Altman is 15-4-1 and one in uh, – in the tournament ATS. Um, so he's pretty damn good to back. And then um, Colorado state, I actually have sweet 16 feature on just because playing team always makes run to a sweet 16. And I think they have a good draw against uh, Texas and, you know, catching Tennessee on a, a night they can't score anything. I think they got the defense that they could potentially do it. So 12 to one, it was, it was worth a little shot. No, and that's what, that's exactly what I was going to go into next is I was going to say any future bets, um that you that you think are really good or anyone um any spreads in this first round that you think are really going to be ones to key in on what are your best bets going forward going into the first round and going forward oh you're on mute no i didn't uh, strike two Damn. all right there we go um i actually bet oregon minus 110 um i think they're like even money now but yeah uh charlie touched on it and dante is healthy cousin art and uh um, Shell Stad have been playing really great. I, I think they're going to get it to, uh, to South Carolina, who started to kind of regress a little bit. They were they were monsters, and then they uh, they had that I forget who they beat, but they had a gigantic win, and then they kind of just uh, moved on down the stretch. They weren't uh, they weren't as good, in my opinion. So I have them losing. And uh, yeah, I just, like I said, Colorado State Sweet Sixteen just in the uh, I think they beat Texas, so having a twelve to one money line against Tennessee just in case. Um, I think it's worth a little bit of a sprinkle. And Bill Self, um, when his team has won, uh, gone 500 or worse uh, in the road in conference play, he's bowed out in the second round uh, five straight or five times. All five times it's happened, it's been in the second round, they get exited. So um, just a little fun nugget no. if uh, someone cares. But yeah, <laughs> interesting. But Noma Color Jr. Is, is crucial. And then Dickinson dislocated his shoulder last game. So we'll see uh, how well he's doing. But that was about a week or so ago. So. Um, better than, you know, three days ago. Well, I'll tell you what, being a Michigan fan, uh, Hunter Dickinson in that in the white and blue definitely doesn't sit well with me by any means. So um, hopefully he gets back to the floor. But honestly, I could love that. I would love to see them go out. doesn't matter to me by any means. Charlie, you're next, my friend. Anything in the first round that really excites you or going forward? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't really like to play the first two weekends. I think that's where all the chaos is. So that's where you kind of want to wait, let the dust settle, and then you know who's legit. Instead, I like to, you know, look more towards futures for who I think gets there. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll finish with my national championship bets. But uh, uh, for things that aren't national championship related, I like Houston to win the South. I don't think plus 135 is the best value, but I love the region. Um, so just something to sprinkle on. I think Oregon to the Sweet 16 at plus 470 is just highway robbery. That's absurd value. Uh, it's my biggest value play. Um, another one I like is, uh, you know, I touched on, I think Florida is a favorable sector with the colic injury issues. So them at plus 270 to the Sweet 16. If you feel even more risky, or uh, Florida to the Elite Eight is plus 540. Uh, Illinois to the Elite Eight is plus 235, and so is Kentucky, which kind of surprised me because I think both of them are realistic to the Elite Eight. Uh, another value play I love is Gonzaga at plus 470 to the Elite Eight, uh, and you can kind of just hedge that. Then if you think it's pretty much guaranteed to be Gonzaga versus Purdue, you would just hedge that and bet the other way. So that's something I would, I'll would i be taking, uh, as well as Baylor to the Elite Eight, plus 320. Uh, my best bet for, like, the shorter term is uh, Gonzaga to the Sweet 16 at plus 116. Unfortunately, when the 
Injury news came out for Kansas that went down from like plus 150. So that's probably going to keep going down. So if you like that, I'd get on it. And then uh, real quick for my national championship bets, a few that aren't creative is UConn and Houston. Just don't overthink it. If you are looking for value, uh, Auburn was plus 2200 last night. They're already down to plus 1800. So I jump on that if you like them. Again, I think that this year's UConn. Tennessee is interesting. I know no team that's lost their first conference game is gone or uh, conference tournament game is gone on to win March Madness, but plus 1800 is interesting. And then the closest value wise I could find to like my UConn bet last year is Baylor at plus 3500, who I think has so many different guys that can do it. And uh, so that would be uh, my bets. And just be sure to bet them this time. Why don't you? No, um, there was no fire alarm to stop me this time. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But someone will turn off your water or something to make you lose your bets on this time. Noah, I'll go to you. Anything you're looking forward to for this first weekend or anyone going forward? Yeah, no, I'm I'm not as big of a basketball or college basketball guru as these two below me. But a, a team that I'm very interested in moving forward is Tennessee. Um, the when I actually I got a chance to to see him in person at Rough when they came and kicked our ass uh, here in, in Lexington. Um, but I, I just think the top of that bracket is a little fraudulent. So I think their their path to the Elite Eight and, and possibly to the Final Four is one that might be a little easier than some. Um, I've actually got them winning the whole thing, which if you guys are in our bracket thing, and if you're not, make sure you sign up for that That's and what I was gonna say. get into our tournament challenge. Um, you, you'll see it, uh, I think, tomorrow is when you can kind of see where everybody's got uh, you know teams going. I've got Tennessee winning the whole thing. Um, I just think when they're playing their best best basketball i think they're a, a very dangerous team so uh that is definitely one team that i'm interested to see moving forward and if they lose in the second round it really wouldn't surprise me i, I think this this year is just absolutely chaotic it's a shit it, we, we it's say a it every year but this year of all years is just it's outstanding well, i mean we talk about it right there's not a whole there's not one i mean you have uconn right but there's not a one team that really stands out to everybody else you know the years of old are pretty much gone. You have the Dukes, the Kansas that really kind of stand out to everybody else. Now that really has gone by the wayside. I feel like there's a lot of different ways that you can go and a lot of bets kind of grab that value as opposed to just trying, you know, hammer Duke at minus 110 to win the championship and obviously losing it every year because that's what just what Duke does. But anyway, guys, um, this has been a fantastic show. Obviously, a very long show, but the viewership has been absolutely fantastic the whole way through. Cannot, cannot thank you guys enough. Obviously, Trevor, thanks so much for coming on and talking college basketball with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And obviously, hopefully, I can see you guys on the, the pump fake pie when we go over when the Absolutely. couple weekends in a year where, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the horse racing is really in the limelight nowadays. But um, like I said, these two guys below me are fantastic with college basketball. Go give them a follow on both Twitter um, and the pump fake pod and Trevor, I'll kind of throw it to you to kind of close out the show. Anything you guys are working on um, with your guys' podcast or anything you guys want to anything you want to promote? Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna figure some things out in, in the summer. Like we said, we had just started at the uh, beginning of the season, so um, we'll we'll do some shows uh, throughout the se- or off season for college basketball and stuff. But we'll branch out into other stuff too. Um, I mess with baseball, and he does. Uh, football and, and other sports so we'll branch out but uh definitely um kentucky derby we're looking forward to having you on um at pump fake pod on twitter and youtube um so yeah looking forward to it and uh thanks for having me on appreciate it yeah like i said man you know i knew right when i met you that you'd be a good fit for <laughs> the show and like i said i appreciate you coming on and talking college basketball with this but noah bring in back on uh as he brought up Join the March Madness pool, guys. HHH Racing Podcast on YouTube, episode 68 of Betting and Boozing. Tonight is the last night. Obviously, you have, you have until the tournament starts tomorrow morning, but not many of us wake up in the morning and want to sign up right now. Go So while you're while you're waiting, go do it right now. It is in the link of in the description. Password is capital B, lowercase n, capital B, 2024. And get yourself for enter for free. And especially if you're come if you're watching on Trevor's Twitter, come to uh the hhh racing podcast youtube channel give us a subscription and please join up and get your opportunity for your free money and your free bet and booze and hhh racing podcast merch but for my co-hosts noah maher charlie freeman our fantastic guest trevor at stooly picks on twitter this has been your host kyle roscoe in episode number 68 of betting and boozing here on the hhh racing podcast until next time everybody 
crush those bets, win those photos, and stay safe, everybody. We'll see you in the next one. Have a great night, guys.